We will call this meeting of the City Council Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency in session. I believe tonight we have some special guests who are going to be leading us through the Pledge of Allegiance. Troop uh, Boy Scout Troop 321. Thank you, gentlemen. As you can see, we're all well trained. We stood up before you even told us to. So, um, um, uh, you, as you can see, we're all well trained. We stood up before we were even even directed to. Um, all right. So, uh, changes to the order of the agenda, Mr. Mulpey, Jeff, do we have any? No changes from staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, any from the dais? Um, I am going to suggest, since we have, at, I have at least, I think, six or seven cards here, speaker cards, that I believe are related to uh, uh, an item that will be coming up in council communications and announcement that if it's all right with everybody, I'm going to do the general public comment first before we, we do that. So we'd move that up. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Um, report from closed session. Greg. There is no report from closed session, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Greg. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to do uh, um, the public comment, general public comment, a little out of order here. Uh, I do ask that speakers, when they come up, try and limit themselves to about two minutes each. Um, we do have a number of people who wish to talk tonight. We want to make sure everybody gets treated fairly and equally. So uh, I'll announce names, and I'll do them in pairs. So we'll have individuals come up, and the next person can basically uh, be getting ready to, to come up. First up is Matt Coet followed by Katie Stamos. And I apologize if I mess up anybody's name. Feel free to correct me. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address the council this evening. My name is Matt Coet. I'm a San Carlos resident and have lived at 123 Wilshire Court for nearly 16 years. I am also the chairman of the board of directors of the San Carlos Charter Learning Center, or SCCLC. I'm speaking to you this evening to express my support for a possible land swap between the city and the, <coughs> the San Carlos School District to make the North Crestview parcel available for development as a new school site for SCCLC. For background, SCCLC is the oldest charter school in California, having the distinction of holding charter number one from the state. As a public charter school, SCCLC operates with autonomy under a charter approved by the San Carlos School District. Our funding stream is essentially identical to the district on a per-student basis. And we are also full partners in the community-wide fundraising organization, the San Carlos Education Foundation. We've been working in close partnership with the district on solving our school land use issues <coughs> and challenges. As a school of choice, drawing our enrollment from across the entire district, we're the only portable school in the, in the sense that no local attendance boundary ties a specific neighborhood to SCCLC. Our students come from any, every corner of the district, <coughs> including the neighborhood around this site. We have affirmed to the district our readiness to move to a new home that can suitably, be suitably built to accommodate our educational program for up to 400 students. After years of searching, however, it is clear that our city is nearly depleted of suitable land for a new school construction. The opportunity to conclude a successful transaction to develop the North Crestview site may be the last best hope to avoid further impacting the community with more school crowding, traffic congestion, athletic field loss, and general reduction in the quality of life. Much work remains to reach an equitable agreement between the city and the district, and you'll be hearing from many stakeholders. Please know, know that I am supportive of this proposal. Also, if you would like to learn more about our school, I invite you to visit us. We are very, very proud of what we've accomplished in the past 20 years, and we'd be happy to show you what it is that we do. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you, Matt. Katie Stamos. Good evening. And, uh, pardon me. And followed by uh, uh, Jessica Welcome. Katie. 
Good evening. My name is Katie Stamos. Um, I want to uh, echo um, the previous comments and express my support for the land swap and please urge the board to um, place the item on the April 14th agenda. Um, I also ask that you consider it from the perspective of what is the best outcome for the most San Carlos residents, not only currently, but over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, there will be tens of thousands of students that are educated in our public schools over that time. There will be tens of thousands of children and adults who will use our public fields. And I do ask that you will take into consideration our long-term public interest. Um, I understand that this is a difficult issue. Um, I think that the faith that we place in all of you when we um, elected you is that, uh, is that we, you would take those on and consider them with an open mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Jessica, welcome, followed by uh, Carrie Giles or Giles? Giles. Giles, thank you. My name is Jessica Welcome. My family and I, which includes my husband and our two daughters, now ages five and eight, moved to San Carlos from San Francisco in 2010. Out of all the possible towns on the peninsula, we chose San Carlos. I could say that we chose it for its excellent schools or its thriving downtown, or that it reminded my husband and I of the small New England towns in which we grew up. And while all of this is true, the real reason we chose San Carlos is because everywhere we went, we saw children. Four years later, I still see children everywhere. And I'm told that this trend will continue upward. I love this town, and I love our schools, and I'm increasingly sad that my children will likely have to go to another town for high school because the land was sold to build houses. Houses that are now filled with children who also have no local high school. There will always be developers here, but the sad reality is that there won't always be land for the public good. This city is full of children, and children need schools that can accommodate them. They also need wide, open spaces in which to play. I am here tonight to urge the City Council to address the proposed public land swap in open session at its April 14th meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Carrie Giles, followed by Karen Molinari. I'm sorry, my name is Karma Giles. Oh, Karma. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. I, you told me that before and it just slipped by me. I uh, live in San Carlos, up in the Crestview uh, uh, Park area. And in full disclosure, I want to say that I am a member of the Board of Directors. But I, I want to make it very clear that I'm here to speak on my behalf and not those of the homeowners at Crestview Park. I've lived in San Carlos for 45 uh, years. 15 of those years I've lived up on Crestview. I had three children and went through the schools here and my main reason when I moved here were the quality of the schools and the locations. During those years I was present when they sold three different proposed school sites in the Crestview area for money. My children just finished the high school when they tore it down and put up more large homes for the money. I am so grateful to live in a country that cares about the education of their children. And I am here on behalf of the community and myself to say that we need to continue our efforts along this. And the charter school has struggled for over almost 20 years. I've watched them grow and look for a permanent home. They, they are a wonderful asset to our community and something to be very proud of. And as someone else said, we were the first charter I uh, encourage you to think positively and work in favor of this land swap. Thank you. And again, my apologies. Um, Karen Molinari, followed by Patty Brown. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Karen Molinari, and I live on Coleman Court in the San Carlos Hills. I was born and raised here in San Carlos. I had the pleasure of attending Heather, Tara Linda, and Carlmont as I was in eighth grade the year that San Carlos High closed, both of my parents' alma mater. I feel very lucky, though, that I've been able to return here to this town and raise with my husband our children, who are fourth-generation San Carlins. I don't know too many people in this town that can say that. Okay? I ask that you seriously consider this land swap between the city and the San Carlos School District. And as somebody who has, the previous um, speaker said and noted, 
watch the city sell land and, and remove San Carlos High School, remove Loreola School, thankfully keep Terra Linda, because now we're seeing how much it's needed. I really ask that you consider the long-term sustainability and quality of life in our community over a short-term financial gain. And I really hope that you will seriously consider this land swap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dimitri Vandellos. Oh, oh, uh, Ms. It, Patty Brown. It, um, hang on a second, Dimitri. Actually, you know what? I, no, I owe you an apology. You were actually speaking on an item that's on the agenda. I, that's yes. Okay. So you knew that, and I forgot. So thank you, Dimitri. Followed by Ben Fuller. Someone help me here with the uh, do the slide thing. <clears throat> yeah, I know it is, but there's there's a way to oh read mode or something full screen mode. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm here on a slightly separate a subject. Um, it's about the Caltrain electrification EIR, and um, it's really what I'm seeing as a reneging of the trees uh, that were. Uh, proposed for the transit village. Uh, in the EIR, the draft tree inventory uh, has an estimated number of trees to remove as 78 of just about 80 trees. Uh, you can take a look here uh, from the EIR document. Um, it's all around the train station. Um, from, what I, from what I can make out of uh, the somewhat obtuse EIR is uh, the sections in yellow are where the uh, canopies occur. Um, and uh, basically what I'm calling it is the Caltrain Sam Trans Kill the Redwoods Plan. Uh, it's stating that they're going to, clearly stating that they're going to cut down all the redwood trees, which uh, they had spoken about as being used as screening for the transit village. Uh, the redwoods happen to be the official state tree of California. Uh, this EIR was not written yesterday. Um, on the public record, I, I placed on the public record um, emails from Sam Trans staff that was part of uh, quite a number of discussions. Uh, San Fran staff uh, denied that there would be any removal of trees and stated the existing trees would provide screening. And it looks like that's not going to happen. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, as a matter of fact, there, there's, how, how do I go backwards here? Ah, here we go, yeah. Um, uh, you know, Caltrain San Fran talks about outreach. There's about seven people in that, in, in that public meeting. Uh, right by the train station, you can see the uh, uh, redwoods. These are all going to be gone. It isn't clear whether or not if it's going to be a kill the poplars that are on the other side of the berm. And uh, San Carlos has a municipal code that uh, does not protect redwoods, uh, but other, um, other uh, uh, municipalities do indeed protect redwood trees. Um, and uh, I ask, why doesn't the city of San Carlos do the same thing? Uh, shouldn't we protect our state tree? Uh, so I'm asking that uh, we make this right. Um, the city, San Trans, and Legacy need to come up with a new plan to plant more trees as part of Eastside Connect along the sidewalks that, uh, than the plan currently shows. This is eminently possible and plausible since all of the underground utilities are now being routed under Old County Road. We're also asking that bell bouts for additional trees along residential streets, especially south of Holly, be made as part of any mitigation plan for the reneging of trees along the burn by Sam Trans, and as a way to compensate for the uglification of the San Carlos train station and the berm that borders our neighborhood. Frankly, I feel that uh, Sam Trans should be uh, footing the bill for these trees. Uh, and uh, within the report, it clearly shows that 50% of the trees in San Carlos that they encountered were redwoods. Uh, additionally, this is, this is what we're going to be seeing, just stark poles uh, with el electric lines. Dimitri, how much more time do you think uh, you need? I'm, I'm pretty much done. Um, okay. And I have one other uh, uh, thing I wanted to say. Uh, it, regarding the land swap, I, I do think that any land swap deal has to be discussed and debated in the open. Uh, but I do ask is what happened to the plant Crestview off-ramp on 280. 
And uh, does that land swap endanger that in any way, shape, or form? So uh, I know later on the, in the agenda, there's a talk about Holly Street, but we have to understand traffic from a holistic standpoint and not just concentrate in one area uh, in regards to freeways and traffic. So uh, that's, you know, I, I do encourage the council to publicly discuss the land swap. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Ben Fuller. Hello, Council. Ben Fuller, President of Greater St. Carlos Neighborhood Association. It's great to see everybody here uh, from our city. Um, we've been here the last seven or eight years, and it's nice to see all the folks showing up on an important issue. Um, as you guys know, we're kind of the only game in town, so it's for the first time ever I'm hearing about another area in San Carlos actually being developed. Um, every single project always is in our neighborhood, so it's really cool that we're thinking about some other stuff. Um, and, and to actually have everyone involved instead of just not coming to the meetings. Uh, one quick thing I would say is uh, I want to support that idea of that 280 interchange is we know all the traffic, every single car goes by our houses. I have a million dollar house, it's worth a lot of cash, so it's not like I'm a poor guy, so don't get the wrong idea. We're all high level people in this town. We all have to share the impact. One other thing I want to say is there are a lot of options. The east side, I know a few of you ran on the idea of doing some other stuff on the east side. We've got a paint place that's moving. We've got some other places that are moving. So, you know, there are other options, but, you know, we know you guys have a tough decision. We know there's some really rich guys up on that hill who want to come after you because they have tons of cash and it's all about them. But let's, let's live as a community together. One last thing I want to say, um, we're really disappointed with Sam Trans, the people that run our train, that we're getting railroaded. Uh, we live on the other side of the track. That's a historical term. And what that means is uh, we've been promised trees. We've been promised a great community. We understand now they're trying to back out of building the transit village we spent 10 years building because they didn't get their way. They're like little kids flipping the checkerboard because they're not going to get their cash. And we just want to let you know that we're not going to stand by idly. Um, and if, if they threaten to leave town, you don't need them. You can bring in Google, Apple. There's all kinds of other great companies. If they want to be bad neighbors, let them go. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Ben. Um, Stacy Emery, which is the last of my cards currently, but it looks like there may be one more at least. You're up, Stacy. Thanks for having me here, you guys. My name is Stacy Emery, and I'm the director of the San Carlos Charter Learning Center. Um, I've had the pleasure of being with the school since we opened our doors uh, back in 1994, and at that time we were in an office building down on Harbor Boulevard, and uh, we've had a very fortunate to have a nice relationship with our school district. I think it's one of the reasons we're still here 20 years later. Um, and I really um, have appreciated the collaborative process as they try and find space for our program. And it's, like I said, it's been a problem and a, a, an issue ever every year um, since we started. So I would really encourage you to have a conversation about this land swap. Uh, you heard from our board chair. We're very supportive of uh, the idea and, and would hope that you guys would be able to to have that conversation in open session to hear all the different stakeholders So thank you for your time Thank you, Ms. Emery um, Now my last card is Rob Holden Good evening um, Thank you very much for uh, taking my taking my comments. I just wanted to all, uh, also step up in support of the land swap issue, um, mostly just to bring the awareness up. I uh, am the president of San Carlos United Soccer Club. I've also been a resident of San Carlos for 18 years. Uh, lots of kids have played. I mean, it's, I think, it's well documented. The, uh, the real concern we have over lack of playing fields and uh, uh, not only will this be great community benefit, the land swap issue, but also uh, uh, just uh, access to additional fields and, and really the, the, the bigger issue is just uh, the risk of losing uh, another field if we don't find, uh, find a way to build on this uh, with this land swap. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention, uh, the support of the San Carlos United Soccer Program uh, and having you debate this at the next open session and, uh, and bring that issue forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Kathy Mark. I wasn't really prepared to speak, but I'm going to be the negative Nelly of the group. My name is Kathy Mark, and I've been a resident of San Carlos for 20 years, of which those 20 years I have lived in Crestview Estates. Um, during the time 
The reason why I moved here from New England, I, I was attracted to that area because of its open space. And over those 20 years, I have seen San Carlos prosper, change, grow. But I do think that we need to consider everything. The Crestview Estates is made up of 277 units. The La Ventana environment is made up of approximately 100 units. And unlike another statement that was made, there are not very many children in that area. I do have a son in the sixth grade at Tierra Linda, and I totally understand the need for changes in our schools and expansion for future population. However, <clears throat> I don't necessarily feel that this is the right place. There are traffic problems up in Crestview. Some of them are speed related. Some of them during certain times of the day are in fact congestion related, though a lot of people don't realize that. It's also become a thoroughfare, a cutoff from Edgewood uh, entrance to 280, up past and down Club Drive, um, down uh, Britain, et cetera. So we do have a traffic problem um, there that needs to be considered. Um, I, I, I am glad that it's now open to the public, and I would just like to say that there are people, plenty of people, who need to stand up and speak out. There are other options. And one of the other key things I wanted to make was in reading the articles that I saw in the newspaper, fields are, yes, important. However, in, in the paper, and I don't know what, if you read everything is true or not, um, having fields behind Tierra Linda would require that the city purchase a home and demolish it so that we can make a new entrance. I don't know if that's going to come about, so how do we have a field behind the school without adding more problems there? Um, additionally, the projects for facilities in the San Carlos School District uh, are estimated to be $150 million. We, already have, we only have $75 million of that. Um, funded to my knowledge. So I anticipate that any new school building would require yet another measure on our ballot. Um, so I don't know, well, there might be a lot of people who own million dollar homes up in Crestview area. Um, I don't know how much you can get from a stone. The income and, and economy has changed, but there are limits as to what we can do. So even if we did have a land swap, do we have the funds to actually build that school? Or can we take the funds that would be required to make it an equitable trade? Ms. Mark, how much that? longer do you think you'll need? And use that to build on the land that the school districts already own. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandy Rosinko? Good evening, council members. Thank you. I'm sure you probably know who I am because I also have been emailing you and I'm I am a resident of, on Crestview Drive, and I, again, also have to kind of weigh in on the, the side of concern. Because, frankly, um, I, while I understand the need to expand schools, I don't think you appreciate the impact of, that it would have on the neighborhood from a traffic perspective. And, and your response, Mayor, for example, is that, you know, you want to make sure that one area is not impacted disproportionately than another, and I can appreciate that. It's a hard decision to make, but I submit that that our neighborhood, including the, the people who reside on Club Drive all the way up to the top, as well as Melendi and Bertan, are going to see an amazing traffic increase um, from this project. And I don't think that that is being adequately considered. Um, I, too, want it on the ballot. I, do, I, too, want people to weigh in. I think April 14th is, frankly, not enough time because we've just started to get information out to our residents. I don't think people on Club Drive and other drives that will be impacted have, in fact, been alerted to this. So I would ask that, yes, it be put on the agenda for public comment. Um, but I don't think April 14th is the right date. I think it needs to be deferred until the next month and, and discussed then when there's been adequate time to inform the residents of the neighborhood that will be impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosinko. Hi, my name is Rob Cohen. I uh, am a parent of two kids at the San Carlos Charter Learning Center, and I live up in Crestview Park, and I just wanted to support the um, bringing forth the land swap on April 14th. I think it will be uh, very important. I think it's important to expand um, in an area such as this, and I just wanted to to say that I, I actually think that um, that just in general, it's a, it's a very good idea and needs to be brought forth as as others have stated. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right. Um, that was the last of the public speaking cards that we had for topics not on the agenda. Um, so with that, thank you, all, thank you all, by the way, for uh, pretty much adhering to the two minute or less uh, uh, limit, which, which we all appreciate, and I know you all do as well. Um, next item is going to be uh, council communications and announcements. Cameron. Thank you, Mark. Um, the only communication I have is one that we are all aware of, which is uh, I attended the strategic retreat last week, which I thought was um, a very good, collaborative, creative session, and uh, we came up with a lot of great priorities for the next six months, and I'm really excited um, to get to work. Thank you, Cameron. Matt. Thanks. Attended a meeting with... Uh, Mr. Grisilli and the architect regarding the remodel for the space that we're in. Um, and I suppose those types of final decisions, while we gave some comment to the architect, will be coming to the dais. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to comment on really is this uh, issue about the trees along the rail corridor. And I'm Wondering, Mr. Mayor, if we might have something on the dais at some point soon regarding that issue. And it was alluded to the idea of the transit village possibly changing or whatever. And I, I, don't, I haven't heard what that schedule is. So if we could get some information from that from staff or if you happen to know, I would be happy to know that. Uh, Ashley, I was, uh, uh, it's your lucky day. We need two people to do it, and I agree with you. I'm sure others may as well. I'm not trying to imply nobody else does. Uh, I think we should agendize that, Jeff, uh, or both a review of the situation and a response potentially to Caltrain. Very good. Thank you. So, including the trees. Including the trees, yes. Um, anything else? That's it. Bob. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, um, I would just uh, echo Mr. Uh, Grocott's uh, comments about uh, our meeting about the uh, Redesign of this uh, this room. Uh, it'll be coming to, needless to say, it'll be coming to the full council when we have all the the, the ducks lined up. I think it's going to be a, a marvelous project. Um, I don't believe that there's any meetings that I went to in the last two weeks. I'm trying to think of what. Well, I don't think we had any scheduled uh, items except our, as Mr. as Cameron said, uh, uh, our uh, our retreat. So uh, no no other comment. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, didn't do a lot in the last couple of weeks. I did attend, uh, the, uh, I'm part of the uh, uh, Housing and Community Development Committee, which is a, a county committee which doles out the paltry funds it gets from the federal government to help people <laughs> with various uh, housing improvement projects and that sort of thing around the county. Also uh, attended a HART program committee meeting, which is another uh, organization. HART is uh, Housing Endowment and, uh, and uh, Real Estate Trust. And we talked about, again, uh, finding ways for HART to invest its uh, funds for better uh, housing and uh, uh, low-income housing and affordable housing in the county. And then I'd just like to add my uh, agreement to uh, Cameron's comment about our retreat. It's very productive, and uh, you get a lot of good ideas when you have uh, several hours to talk about what the best things are, what the future, are, uh, future is for the city. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep my comments very brief and uh, uh, basically uh, ask my colleagues uh, consideration that we have staff put on a future agenda. I would suggest the April 14th meeting, uh, the beginning of a discussion about uh, the land swap proposal that the uh, um, uh, San Carlos School District uh, brought, to, brought forward uh, last week. And I emphasize beginning because I know a number of speakers and a number of people that we've all heard from by email um, have registered concerns about uh, their sense of abruptness of how this suddenly appeared in, in the public uh, space. Um, and I think it's important that we have a, a thorough discussion um, I, it, and look at all the issues. Um, uh, the final result of all of that will have to be, a, will no doubt be a difficult decision to make, um, but you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step and, and uh, I think we ought to do this and just determine if it's something we want to consider. And if we do, great, we can direct staff to do that, negotiate on our behalf, and if, uh, if uh, we don't for whatever reason or the timing doesn't work out, then the school district will at least have an answer on that. 
Well, I'll, uh, I would generally like to agree with that. I just want to make sure that we, ha we do have a thorough discussion. Um, what I would like to do is have the agenda item on uh, potentially for the 15th if staff is agree agreeable to that. But I'd also like the council at that time to consider uh, the possibility of putting the, that property uh, on the market. Uh, we have, uh, everybody here on this diocese has received literally dozens of emails since last week, since last Wednesday. Um, emails were coming in tonight as I was walking into the council meeting. There are a lot of people with a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different ideas as to what uh, this project or what, what uh, is the best for the city. Uh, a lot of people think, believe passionately that a land swap is the best, is the best thing to do for our children. Uh, having grown up here, uh, having gone to three of the schools and worked at a fourth uh, that wasn't necessarily in the district but was in the city, um, I'm a product of the school system. So I don't want anybody to get the idea that I'm not uh, you know, supportive of, of uh, what is best for uh, the San Carlos School District, I, I am. I'm, my children also went through the school system here as well, as did my wife. But there are a lot of issues that we need to explore. Um, uh, one speaker talked about the possibility of what will happen if uh, we do the land swap. Where will we find that money uh, to develop the field? That's a very good point. It would cost somewhere between 10 and $15 million to develop that field. So we have to talk about that. We have to talk about all the unfunded projects that we have in this town. And even if we end up doing this, I want to make sure that I can talk to people and answer their questions and be able to say to them, we looked at every possibility and we, did, and we made the best decision that was for this town. I, I don't think it's something that we should uh, consider lightly or that we should rush into. So there may be some alternatives that absolutely turn people's stomachs. But I think we ought to consider all of them. I have an open mind. I haven't made up my mind either way um, or any way because there are more than two options here. But I think we ought to talk about it. And uh, if the 15th works for staff, I'm, I'm probably okay with that. 14th might work better. Did, did I say the 15th? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I think we all knew what you meant. Oh, come on the 15th. <laughs> no, no, I think we're probably thinking about taxes. I was thinking about my, my taxes. I, I, actually, April 14th. I, I am... Uh, 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 since you know I made the proposal, I am fine with uh, clarification because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, uh, I, I am a supporter of this uh, for reasons that I've described. Um, if there are issues that come up that cause me to change my mind, so be it. Um, but really, the issue that we have to decide is is whether you know what do we want to do with anything, because the other option is to do nothing at all. Okay, but the discussion needs to get started. So, seeing that there are at least two council members who want to do that, Jeff, uh, please. Well, Mr. Mayor, through the chair, can I make a comment, please? Oh, um, certainly. Mr. Malpe, what is on the 14th? And are there items that we need to talk or uh, accomplish for the, uh, you know, that possibly could trump this? Um, Timing items. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a copy, actually, of the 14th agenda, the draft agenda in front of me. Um, we'll be discussing it tomorrow. Uh, if it's a desire of the council, we'll move things around to try to balance the agenda so that we get the business that we need to accomplish and there are some items that need to come forward. One item that is scheduled to come forward on the 14th is, in fact, a discussion of the uh, electrification EIR uh, because the comment period closes the end of April. So we'd like to get the comments from the council at that meeting so that it could uh, come forward. The uh, public works director just informed me of that. Uh, so there are some other items as well, but we can juggle it around and, and take a look. And uh, if it's not at all possible uh, to do, uh, we'll get it the very next available uh, meeting if there's things that have to be done. Well, that's the only concern, Mr. Mayor, is that, you know, if there could be timing, I, and I'm not trying to say we should, I'm not trying to delay this, but I'm trying to make sure that we also get the rest of the work done that we have to get done in the city. And this is certainly not, a smart, as I mentioned in the paper, it's not going to take five minutes to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that we have enough time and uh, to, to discuss it. So that's the only concern I have. Otherwise, I have no problem discussing it in public. I just want to make sure it's, it's done on a timely basis as the, with the rest of the things that have to be done in, in San Carlos. You know, I, I guess I, I think that's a very well, point very well taken. Um, I didn't mention it in my, my comments. Uh, I am anticipating that there will probably be several discussions, se several meetings over which we'll be discussing this. Um, uh, uh, you know, 
large things tend to take time to work through, both in oh, terms absolutely. of comments and thoughts. Well, I know so, we're going to decide on the 14th or whatever if we right. talk about that, it. That's my point. I, I just want to make sure that we have enough, uh, and we don't, it all of a sudden doesn't become the 800 pound gorilla and the rest of the city's business gets pushed to the side. I just okay. want to make sure we all get it squared away. Uh, no. Matt? Uh, the, the only comment I wanted to add to the back and forth here is that uh, you know, when we first started getting emails, and we've certainly gotten a lot of emails, uh, I haven't been able to respond to but 1% of them, and that was in the very beginning, and, and I simply wrote back to people they were requesting. You know, the, the, I, there were those who were surprised to know that this was even being discussed. There were those who, hearing that it was being discussed, wanted it on the agenda for the 14th, and I merely wrote back to them and said, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly discuss it from the dais at some point, um, and uh, you know that may or may not be the 14th, but that kind of thing is up to the mayor and the city manager. So that is revealing of my feeling about it. Is you know I think that's in part why we go through the process of electing a mayor and uh, is to set the agenda. And if it seems to be something that's important for the 14th, so be it. If it comes later, uh, so that that's where I'm coming from on it. Fair enough. Can, can I just ask one point of clarification for mm -hmm. for our benefit, for the public's benefit? And Jeff, do you have a sense of what what is it that we would do on the 14th? What would we discuss or what's what's being proposed other than to have a discussion? Well, I think you know, first and foremost, there's there is a concept that that's becoming increasingly well known um, in terms of the school district's uh, initial proposal to us to do some form of a, a land swap with property at TL. Um, the council previously going back uh, a little more than six months ago now had discussed the Crestview property independently and told staff to begin taking a look at uh, possible uh, disposition of that property uh, and just gathering some factual data. We haven't really gotten a long way on that for two reasons. One, pg and &E came up right after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, um, the school district, our ongoing discussions with the school district who's been exploring with us really since about the time that their uh, measure passed, the possibility of, of different concepts utilizing or sharing city property for the creation of uh, future schools. So we don't have a lot of factual data. I think going back from the city's perspective, it's important to kind of, I think, for the council to go back to the beginning of this conversation and talk about, you know, one, whether or not you want to do anything with that, that property, um, and two, um, uh, you know, what, what are the outcome priorities for the city council if that property were traded or liquidated, you know, how do you want to see that that uh, uh, capital or future property acquisition invested in the community? You know, what does it look like? Is it a, a park at TL? Is it streets? Is it economic development? Is it uh, flooding? You know, I mean, we have approximately 200 plus million dollars in unfunded capital need in the city, so it far exceeds the value of the, the, that we're going to generate from the property. But understanding what the council's priorities are, uh, and then having that dialogue with the community is, is what I think the first steps ought to be. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. All right. Um, I think um, with that, we have probably finished our council communications and announcements. And we will move on to the next item, which is um, presentation of some proclamations to some very well-deserving young men from our community who have... Uh, been patiently sitting through this, and I, I will just mention in passing, this is uh, part of democracy in action. So, Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, 5A, did you want Did I miss 5A? I'm, I'm just really not doing well tonight. That's right. Jeff, I, I terminated your ability to comment. So. And, and I would have jumped in, but I didn't have any comments this evening, recognizing I thought we were going to have a lot of public comment and early dialogue, in the, and it's a very full agenda. No, uh, no apologies necessary. That you, you know, I, you have to do that a lot, which is not a good sign for me, I suppose. Um, but anyway, so we are now moving to uh, our presentation to, as I said, some very deserving young men. You did that using your iPad. Hmm? You did that using your iPad. Young men who have uh, honored themselves in their 
troops and uh, their troop, excuse me. And uh, are you all part of the same troop? Yes, you are. That's what I thought. And uh, our community by the work that you've done. Um, and in fact, uh, we're going to do something a little different with the proclamation tonight just because uh, we want folks to be able to see what you did for your Eagle Scout project and give you an opportunity to talk about it a little bit. So uh, um, I thought what we'd do here as, as uh, Crystal is setting things up, we have this up on our, our computer, uh, Sean. So um, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your project and maybe show us a little bit about it and talk to us about it? Okay, so for my Eagle Scout project, um, I refinished the floors at Mahaney Hall. Um, that's the hall um, that is adjacent to the Children's Learning Center, um, part of the United Ch um, Church of Christ. So um, for that project, I had to um, bring in a hilliard and refinish the floors with a few um, layers of endeavor. It's not a very interesting project, but <laughs> it made the floors sparkle like it hadn't before in about 20 years. Uh, it turns out that the church had been using the wrong um, sort of layering for the floor these entire few years, so we got that clarified. And for now, I believe that we'll have the floors looking much better for the rest of the time. That's great. And uh, um, don't dismiss how hard that is. Uh, I'm having a new house built, and my contractors already told me horror stories about floors and finishing and stuff. So in fact, if you think you have the skills, we might. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, so Hunter, would you like to tell us a little bit about your project? Sure. Hello. My project was at Eaton Park. It was the part of the trailhead. Sorry. We built a map holder, eight foot tall and four foot wide, four foot deep, and it will house a map that currently isn't ready yet, but hopefully it soon will be. Yes, Morgan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and when she puts it in, it'll be complete. It has a tin roof, and it's built out of four by four Two post wood. That was shots. That was my headboard. There we go. There we go. Thank you. And, and actually, uh, thank you both for that. I mean, that's, uh, that, that's going to come in very handy for an awful lot of people. So. We, we do have a third young man who couldn't come here tonight uh, due to a scheduling conflict, Carson Spector. Uh, Carson's project actually involved refurbishing a music studio at the, I'm going to get the name wrong here again tonight, uh, Reichs, the Reichs? Reichs. Reichs, the Reichs Center for Human Enhancement, which also involved doing a lot of uh, uh, patching and repairing and whatnot. So perhaps somebody else who I can have my contractor talk to. No, just kidding. Um, seriously, uh, you know, I really, the applause that you just gave these young men, I think, is, is highly appropriate and well-deserved. I mean, this, these, this is work that people do that they don't have to do. It clearly benefits the community. It makes the world a better place to be. And uh, I always advise, uh, you know, I've always advised my kids, if you can do nothing else in life but make the world a little better than it was before you got here, that's a big thing to do. So you're already well on your way, both of you, all three of you, to doing that. So thank you very much on behalf of the community. And uh, we have some proclamations for you here. Hunter, you. There you go, Sean. And we will make sure that Carson gets his as well. Take You'll take Carson's? Wonderful. Thank you. So again, please, one more round of applause for these wonderful young people. Now, we have one more proclamation to do tonight. Um, uh, which is for an organization that, for my entire life, and probably for most of yours, it always seems that it's always there. Um, and when I first saw the request for proclamation, I was thinking like, oh yeah, that's right, this volunteer organization, they're not, they're not a government agency or anything like that, and that's the American Red Cross. Um, and so uh, tonight what we're doing, um, and uh, by way of uh, making March American Red Cross Month in San Carlos. So. Uh, our thanks very much to all the good work they do, not only in the peninsula, but around the country, um, and definitely an organization worth our recognition and support. Um, oh. 
As you, as you can tell, I'm, I'm new at this. So, you, you think, you'd think the tip off of the red and the red cross would have warned me. But, you know, come on up, come on up. Here. So again, uh, I meant everything that I said, uh, and, and I, I, really do, I really do appreciate all the work that the Red Cross does. And, and the least we can do is recognize, recognize your work and, and remember to have you come up and stand up here in the limelight. So is there anything either of you'd like to say? Um, sure. Thank you. Um, I'm Rod Lair. I am the Disaster Assessment Lead, um, San Mateo County, and the past chair in San Mateo County. And this is Mike Yee, who's our government um, operations lead. And... Uh, I want to thank everybody in our community. Um, we were one city that did not have any disasters that we responded to this year. So that's excellent, one of few. Um, in the past year, we responded to 40 events in uh, San Mateo County, five major events, one, the Asiana aircraft accident, um, two major Redwood City fires, and um, we want to thank you for the proclamation. Um, Red Cross, again, is almost 100% volunteer at our level. We have, in San Mateo County, we have about 150 volunteers, one paid staff person. And it just goes to show you people like Mike that, you know, give, that work every single day without uh, any, you know, with just the satisfaction of knowing we're serving our community. So we thank you very much, and um, let's do no more events next year. Yes, in San that's, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. You know, the paper version doesn't lock up when you walk away from it. You want the paper version? No, no, no that's okay. That's okay. Oh, Mr. Mayor, before we move on. Yes. I would just like to add my congratulations to Sean and, and Hunter. I know you're on your way out. Um, as, a, as a former Boy Scout who stopped five merit badges short, I think I might have mentioned it before, I... I uh, I greatly admire your accomplishment. I think if I had gotten those extra five merit badges, I would have been 46 at the time that I finished. I don't think there's an upper age limit. You might still, <laughs> you might still be able to do that. Um, all right. We will move on now to um, presentations. We have one presentation this evening from uh, uh, Alan Sarver, representing the Sequoia Union High School District. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, staff, and members of the public. I'm very pleased to be here on an evening when uh, the room is so full of active educational supporters uh, in the area because I'm here to talk about the growth going on in the Sequoia Union High School District. I am a member of the Board of Trustees for the Sequoia Union High School District. Uh, both of my daughters uh, graduated from Carlmont High School. and. Uh, <laughs> Very clearly, uh, here in the community of San Carlos, there is a strong awareness of the tremendous growth going on in our schools. But uh, the Sequoia Union High School District extends from Carlmont High School in the north, serving San Carlos and the Belmont Redwood Shores School District, down to uh, Menlo Atherton High School in the south, uh, serving uh, the communities of East Palo Alto and Menlo Park as well as Sequoia and Woodside High School serving the uh, Redwood City as well as uh, Portola Valley and Woodside uh, communities. And San Carlos is definitely not the only school district that has been seeing tremendous enrollment growth over the past decade. Uh, Belmont Redwood Shores, um, Menlo Park City Schools, and Las Lomitas have seen equal or gr greater growth going on during this period of time. And over the past 12 years, the Sequoia Union High School District has absorbed a 20% enrollment growth, and we are now projecting an absolute minimum of an additional 20% enrollment growth by the end of this decade. Uh, the Sequoia Union High School District uh, was, has been well supported by our community from end to end, who have put in place a number of bond measures over the last 20 years 
that have allowed us to modernize and grow our high schools to continue to provide excellent education to the growing number of students we have had. Uh, but we are at the end of available funding as we now see uh, an actual strong rise in the rate at which our population is growing for the coming years. And so the district has been looking at all of the growth options around uh, the district. There is an intention to do uh, some construction on each of our existing comprehensive campuses, but to strongly approach the growth primarily through the addition of new small high schools. Uh, and they are aimed to be at least one in the north here in the San Carlos area that would alleviate some of the growth pressure on Carlmont High School and to a lesser extent Sequoia, and one in the south uh, that would alleviate the even greater growth pressure on Menlo Atherton High School. And uh, with four operating small charter schools in our district, uh, we know that these small alternatives are providing great education value to our community and there's a great appetite for small high schools. So we are excited to be pursuing that as part of our program here. To get all of this accomplished, uh, we, are, we are anticipating a minimum of growth from our current population of 8,400 to a minimum of 10,000 by the year 2020. And with the continuing strong economy on the Mid-Peninsula, uh, the growth of new high-density housing projects along the Caltrain corridor, and the attraction of the great K through 12 schools up and down the peninsula, there is every potential for the growth to, to far exceed that 10,000 number. So we have come up with a plan that will be flexible for that kind of growth uh, and would allow either the expansion of the two small high schools, the addition of more small high schools beyond that, or a bit more growth on the comprehensive campuses, some combination thereof. Uh, to be able to accomplish all of that, uh, the district has identified a need for a $265 million bond, which will go, which is placed on the June 3rd ballot. That translates out to $15.90 per $100,000 of uh, essay value on the uh, on the houses in the greater community. Uh, for a $500,000 home, that's about $80 a year. For uh, a $2 million dollar, uh, tax valued home, that would be about $320 a year. Um, majority of homes at this point are fortunately valued uh, for tax purposes at the lower end of that range. And um, that is coming up on the June ballot. This will enable uh, the addition of some two-story construction on each of the campuses, including Carmont, uh, but again, the greater thrust of the new development being in new small campuses to be developed. Uh, and uh, with that outline, um, I'm happy to answer uh, questions that uh, the council would have. And then uh, I have had the opportunity to speak with uh, several of the council members, and I am looking forward to near future opportunities to, to speak individually with the remainder of you. Um, and with the council's permission, I w we have generated uh, draft wording for a potential resolution in support of Measure A, which I would like to leave with the council for future consideration of in inclusion on an upcoming agenda. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sarver. Um, by way of just explanation for, for my colleagues, uh, Alan, as you mentioned, I was one of the people that Alan uh, met with. Um, and regarding his last request there, I did explain to them, him that historically the council has generally not done that kind of endorsement, but that uh, I certainly had no objections if he wished to make the request, if the council wishes to act on it, or consider, not, obviously not tonight, but at a future meeting, that's up to the council. So with that, uh, questions for Mr. Sarver? Yes, Cameron. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, so you kind of left us with a very sort of enticing uh, potential, um, but, didn't, but didn't go all the way. So I'm, 
I'm a huge proponent of the possibility of um, bringing high school back to San Carlos. I think that it would be a huge community asset. I think one of the challenges for a lot of parents is feeling like they don't know where their kids are going to go to high school, feeling like we separate the town, um, you know, to two, two high schools. So I wanted to maybe um, ask a few specifics. Um, so you, you mentioned that there's money set aside for school construction. I, I noted that it's about $64 million. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how, um, should this bond measure pass, how would the decision be made uh, about where high schools would be cited? And can you talk a little bit about the, the timeline? Yeah. The, you know, the drive uh, primarily is to locate them where, uh, the, first of all, they would both be small career pathway oriented uh, magnet type schools mm -hmm. that would be open to enrollment from across the district. The, uh, the desire and intent of the school board would be that they would be most attractive to the communities in the areas closest to them. Uh, and since the greatest enrollment pressure in the district is on both Carlmont High School and Menlo Atherton High School, the intent would be to look in the area in the south uh, near Menlo Atherton, close to 101 along the areas of either Marsh or Willow Roads um, that would be attractive to the East Palo Alto, um, East Menlo Park, Menlo Park and North Fair Oaks communities and closely accessible to all of those. Uh, in uh, the Carlmont area, the type of thing that might make the most sense would be somewhere, uh, again, probably close to 101, uh, potentially uh, an area within San Carlos. Uh, that would be certainly something we would look at and, and an opportunity to be, uh, to be back uh, meeting with you to work out a lot of details as we go forward. Uh, but an area, for example, uh, close to Holly and Industrial uh, might be very highly accessible and attractive to the um, Redwood Shores community, the Belmont community, the San Carlos community, and the Eastern Redwood City community, uh, all of which would be very effective at the uh, enrollment pressure uh, that we want to alleviate for Carmont and Sequoia. Um, one of the first steps we've taken in beginning strategically to address the enrollment growth was to try to align our high school boundaries more closely with the individual middle school environments producing eighth grade graduates. Uh, and so specifically in the case of Carmont and Sequoia High Schools, the border between them has been aligned now with the border between Tierra Linda and Central so that students that are growing up within the Tierra Linda attendance boundaries will now know from kindergarten going forward that their high school is Carlmont and that as they attend middle school in the Tierra Linda facilities, they are indeed actively partnered with the high school across mm -hmm. the street from them, which includes um, a portion of San Carlos within its boundaries. It is a San Carlos high school. Um, and those uh, that are will be attending Central Middle School, will be actively closely partnered with Sequoia High School. Um, and that type of alignment has been strengthened around the district. Mm -hmm. and, and so just, um, and I appreciate that, and, and, and uh, I think that does give parents some solace. It hasn't always historically been the case, and I think there is even some trepidation that it may not be historically the case going forward. But I think um, having some certainty about that is, is really important. Um, but just back to the other question about what's the process by which sites are chosen and what would be the, what is your um, sort of construction timeline? You know, is it, is it a decade? Is it five years? Is okay. it three years? All right. So uh, we need to have uh, enough new facilities in operation uh, by 2020 to be able to accommodate 20% more population uh, than our high schools that are now operating roughly at capacity. Uh, so, although we are trying to be very strategic and proactive on this, this is not a relaxed schedule. This is a schedule with some urgency in it. Uh, part of the reason why we chose the very aggressive schedule of, of going on the June ballot uh, is that we anticipate a minimum of a two full year uh, period from acquisition of funding to being able to open the first of the new uh, small high schools. Um, if we are fortunate enough to be able to find and acquire 
an existing school site that might be able to be shortened but if we are looking at something like a portion of a light industrial area there may be you know substantial CEQA activities that have to go on which definitely lengthens the schedule so this June election is the minimum gateway to being able to open the first of our small high schools for the fall of 2016 we would ramp them up by admitting a new freshman class each year so that it would take four years to reach full operation we would intend the second one to open a year behind so that we're able to leverage the experience of the first in rolling out the second one so we're already right against a full schedule to get those in operation for that full load of students in in 2020 and would you be interested in the land swap as once funding is secured and we are very actively involved in the land acquisition process we are interested in being extremely flexible creative and coming up with the results that are most beneficial to not only all of the students in the district but all of the communities and the partner organizations we work with great thank you Ron did you have some questions just really just one comes to mind but thank you Alan nice nice report and thank you for calling me the other day about this as you know because we're both on this committee to alleviate traffic issues would any of these proposals take some pressure off of Carl Mott's enrollment would it help reduce it a bit at this point what we're trying to do is everything we can to mitigate the tremendous growth that we anticipate if if we're not building out additional space part of the funding has been allocate allocated with the intention of traffic mitigation support so there is an intent as part of this measure to try and and put a little money behind our active partnership with the city in the Four Corners discussions about the Alameda corridor between Tierra Linda and Carmont if we are as successful as we intend to be with excellent exciting small schools and we are able to open the ones that that are greatly supported and greatly in demand by the public and we see waiting lists in excess of the capacity that we build we will look for opportunities to expand them and and or add new ones at the time so I don't think we are yet on any kind of a trend that would see a decline in the Carl Mott enrollment but the intention is to mitigate it and keep the additional impact to an absolute minimum the two most highly enrollment impacted schools Carl Mott and Menlo Atherton are currently the most fully at their physical capacity for the footprint they sit sit on they are the two that are most deeply embedded in quiet residential communities and they are the two that have the most constricted traffic access so that is where the focus has to be in our district on mitigating the issues and getting it right and that's why I get an early passage of this measure is so critical to the district and then just one more question I you mentioned these would be new small high schools I suspect that they wouldn't have all the amenities that the larger high schools have these would be schools that wouldn't necessarily have a track or a swimming pool or a gym yeah, so or something with, like with that. small high schools you know we've already had a discussion earlier this evening that large tracts of land are not lying around the peninsula waiting to become schools so you you have to be very careful and selective in where you go a school on the order of 400 students or so can be placed on a three or four acre type of parcel rather than the 40 acres that a comprehensive high school would take and so there are a very focused program without ending up trying to be all things to all students the way a comprehensive campus is there are still requirements not only legally but in in any clear understanding of educational responsibility to have a full physical education program available to students of these schools some of the facilities for PE would be present on the small campuses 
we are looking to have at least one of the small campuses that's, that's set up within the district have a substantial physical education park uh, adjacent to it that can be shared by all of the small schools in the district. And we will also look into opportunities to share some of the comprehensive high school, uh, more complete um, athletic facilities as well between the smaller schools. Thank you. Questions? This side? Okay. Um, all right, so uh, uh, there was a request or the, the idea that uh, uh, Alan teed up at the end. Uh, is there interest from the dais at this point of considering um, uh, this type of uh, uh, endorsement or not? Or do people want to think about it some more? And Mr. Mayor, I, you know, echoing what you said earlier, traditionally we haven't done that. And the reason, quite honestly, is that it might not be a unanimous vote. And there could be someone here, any of us, or that wouldn't want to do that. And, but yet we are sort of then, we've endorsed it, even though maybe one or two or three of us didn't want to endorse it. And I think that's what's going on in the past, that we basically uh, individually can do what we feel, but not as a, as a, as a body. So I would, I would say that I don't think we should endor um, look at a, a possible endorsement of, the, of, of this item. Okay, fair enough. Any other, uh, any other comments, observations? All right, well, um, unless, I think unless somebody, uh, uh, just to be clear, uh, I wouldn't have a problem with us considering. I, I take your point, Bob. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good one. Um, on the other hand, there's a, you know, any vote that we take, if I'm on the short end of the stick, it's kind of like, well, the council approved it, but I didn't, but there, there it's okay. Some, there are some differences on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, th that's true. It, it's more, it's perhaps a little more political. Um, I would be fine with doing it, but but it's certainly unless the council wants to do it, I I think uh, we'll I, just I would be happy to to leave the uh, sample language and let the council in its wisdom decide how to proceed. Um, and uh, if it you know does not come for a vote, or if it comes for a vote and is not passed, that you know that would be would be fine. But I'll um, allow Fair that enough. opportunity. Um, and also, I guess a last uh, final comment I would like to uh, mention that. There is a website uh, for the campaign, which is greatsequoiahighschools.org, um, where uh, members of the community as well can go to learn more about the uh, bond issue uh, and can uh, find ways to get involved in support of the campaign, endorse it, or make a donation to it if they so choose. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we actually, that completes our presentations item for tonight. Uh, we've already done public comment. Um, so we are now up to uh, approval of the consent calendar. These are items uh, that are uh, approved, uh, voted on uh, and approved en masse by the council, um, unless a council member wishes to remove one or more items for separate consideration. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to remove item uh, 9E. 9E. Okay, any other requests to remove items? Um, hearing none, then I will entertain motions for approving items 9A through D and F through J. So moved. Is there a second? Excuse me. Second. We do have an ordinance. Uh, uh, you're right, we have, to read the, we have to read the ordinance. So, uh, Bob, you want to read the ordinance? Sure. I think that's... Which yes. one is the ordinance? Oh, it's on my little sheet of paper here. F. Okay. Uh, adopt Ordinance 1474. This is item, I'm not sure, what is it? 9F. Okay. Uh, adopt Ordinance 1474, an ordinance of the City of San Carlos, adding San Carlos Municipal Code Section <coughs> 12.01, encroachments and use, and use city rights of way and public utility easements. Is that sufficient, Greg? Okay. There's a motion and a second. Uh, as I said, there was no discussion on these items. So, Crystal, if you'd call the roll, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Mayor Obert? Yes. And, uh, Matt, we will return to 9E uh, later on in the evening. Okay, that brings us to item 10, study session. The first item is uh, 10A, a study session to review alternatives for the Holly Street Corridor. Looks like we're going to hear from Jay Walter. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, Jay Walter, Public Works Director. Um, pardon me while I, there we are. I get this at least ready to start. <laughs> So before I ask our consultants to come up and, um, and make the bulk of the presentation, I just wanted to um, kind of set the context for the council and for the public listening. Um, several months back, the council indicated a desire to, to um, uh, look into some ways that we could work to relieve congestion along the Holly Street corridor. And uh, I think everyone knows how difficult it can be to traverse back and forth between uh, 101 and the uh, area of downtown, and uh, it can get quite congested at times. And so. Um, we went ahead and hired a consultant to come and, and uh, prepare some alternatives. We were at council a couple of months back to kind of present at least the first, our first uh, thoughts at what those alternatives would be. And, and so tonight we would like to give you some more meat on the bones of those alternatives. And I think we're, um, we're at a point where we really will be looking for your feedback and feedback from the public on these alternatives so that we can then take the next step at your direction. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, bring up Keith Meyer from the design firm of Rajapan and Meyer, who's our lead consultant on the study. He'll start off with a few slides and then introduce the consultant who will be talking to you about the rest of the alternatives. So. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Good evening, Keith. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Nice to be back with you again. Hopefully, we'll clearly explain transportation alternatives again. Um, tonight, uh, as Jay mentioned, we uh, have moved forward with looking at different alternatives, uh, and I would like to characterize it as a potential range of visions for Holly Street. There are minimal visions for improvement of Holly Street. There are some pretty dramatic visions for improvement of Holly Street. Uh, since we are merely engineers who uh, <coughs> implement things, there are a variety of professionals who, who dream very big. Uh, one of those firms is MIG out of Berkeley. Uh, they're a nationally renowned urban design firm. Uh, they've been one of the creators of a program called Complete Streets, which you may have heard uh, recently, which is the development of streets into more than just automobile corridors. Uh, including all users as well as uh, community enhancement. So uh, that's our team for tonight. I'll just do some introduction. Jeff Liljegren from MIG will do the bulk of the presentation. Uh, the goal of this project is to improve automobile access uh, from Highway 101, Highway 101 to El Camino Real in the city center. We all know that it's a tremendous backup during uh, peak hours. It's also a safety problem because we have uh, a very narrow right-of-way. We have uh, very close driveways. Uh, we have narrow sidewalks, and it's not a very, it's not an inviting environment for all users. Um, as you've heard tonight, growth in schools are occurring, uh, as well as we all know, growth in traffic is occurring. We do forecast over the next 20 years that traffic, specifically on Holly Street, will grow 40 percent from what it is today. So that's about 15,000 to 18,000 cars a day today, growing to 22 to 25,000. Uh, the existing corridor and the existing configuration just simply cannot handle that kind of anticipated growth coming from between 101 uh, and the main city center. So uh, what we've been asked to do is take a look at a range of what some options are, some least expensive, some quite expensive. Uh, Jay mentioned that we had first come to you in uh, September to talk about this uh, concept along with the interchange. Uh, we've moved forward with studying a variety of alternatives. We've met with the staff uh, early in March. Uh, tonight we're having our council study session. We do anticipate going out to the community to not only presenting all options that we see, but listening to the residents as to what other options and what other concerns and elements uh, what they would like to see incorporated if incorporated into a project such as that. After that, we'll come back, formulate some ideas, and we'll come back to the council to uh, get your decision on whether you want to move forward with some sort of a project into the next phases of environmental uh, review. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Lusigren with uh, MIG, now that I've built you up to be something special. Um, he's going to talk about the goals of the work that we've done. Uh, the, the study area, the context of, of uh, today and the future, uh, design alternatives, 
uh, focus in on some specific intersections down by Old County Road and El Camino Real. And then I'll come back to wrap it up with some uh, traffic benefits and, and costs. So, Jeff. Thank you, Keith. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mayor, Council. When MIG was brought in to be a part of this great opportunity to work at Holly Street and to think about how it could be rethought for the future, there, as Keith has alluded, there was really four goals that have been brought up to our attention. First being that we need to uh, increase the capacity of Holly Street for automobiles. But we also understand the city has, as it being a very livable city that it is today, has aspirations for the future, for as it grows, to continue to be a very livable and connected community. And to, with Holly Street, to think about ways in which not only do we incorporate cars, but also incorporating bicycle and pedestrian connectivity into the city of San Carlos. The fourth and final goal was also to say, this is a great opportunity where we could possibly showcase San Carlos and look at it and show to people as they visit the community through off the 101 interchange or from El Camino Real how wonderful San Carlos is and will be. Here is your current road network. As you can see, here's, you have interstate uh, exchange of 101. You come down Holly Street, crosses the industrial road here, comes down. You then meet up at Old County Road, and then you get to El Camino Real. Thank you. Built on that road network, you have a great multimodal connectivity already. That includes, hmm, let's put that back on. Let's go to the slideshow. Built on that network, you have a great multimodal connectivity system already that includes both regional and local transit. And you have a burgeoning bicycle network that is building and growing and helping to connect this community within San Carlos and around. Tonight's discussion, we're going to be focusing strictly on Holly Street for the most part, in between Industrial Road and Old County Road. There will be some discussion of the area down here at El Camino Real. But for the most part, our discussion tonight is about that segment between Industrial Road and El and all Old County Road. For the most part, there are three overall alternatives that you're, we'll be discussing. We'll be talking about either not moving the curb at all, moving the curb within the right-of-way, or possibly looking at acquiring right-of-way for a complete street realignment. No curb change. This will be your most cost-effective option. In this approach, we're looking at restriping strategies and maybe innovative options in how to reallocate space within the existing configuration of Old County, of Holly Street. Here's your existing condition. You have a 60-foot right-of-way, of which there's four lanes of traffic. The first two, the middle two lanes are always flowing. But during off-peak hours, the outside lanes act as parking. You have a sidewalk on both sides, and then you have streets and streetlights within the existing right-of-way. You may see, Jeff, we have four lanes of traffic. What's the problem? If you look up at the plan view at the very top of the, of the slide, you'll notice that there is a single line that's painted that's striping that, that roadway. And so when people come off the freeway and they're coming down Holly Street, they're a little confused. They're not quite clear, even though they know that there's four lanes of traffic there. It's not clear of whether or not that inside lane where they should be. And so it, it, it erodes the capacity possibilities of the road as it currently is. And so cars aren't able to pass each other during high peak hours. The city is looking to address that and will be looking to restripe that this year, making sure that those 10-foot lanes that are in Holly Street are clear and so that you will allow for passing of cars as they do queue up and use Holly Street coming from the interchange of 101 down to Old County Road. This will increase capacity and it does already allow for bicycle or for pedestrian connection. What it doesn't offer is a bicycle connection. In the current configuration that you have, you could consider some more innovative thinking, like a green lane. This is basically an enhanced bicycle corridor. What we would do is we would put a green stripe down the center of the travel lane. What this does is it communicates to travelers, motorists, that they are sharing that lane at all times with bicyclists. By doing so, 
This allows for cyclists to feel more safe. It slows down traffic and allows for bicyclists and road and automobiles to function together on that travel lane. If you are comfortable with this, good. There is one downside. By doing the green lane in that outside lane, you have to accommodate an unobstructed pathway for the bicyclist at all times. And so therefore, you wouldn't have parking allowed on during non-peak hours. But if you feel like parking is really important to you, but you still want to have a bicycle facility, there is one more alternative that we can think of if we don't move the curb, and that is looking at what we can do behind the existing curb. Behind the existing curb, you have an existing sidewalk, and you have right away where you have street trees and street lights. We could reconfigure that so that you would have a raised bike lane behind the curb, and you would have an additional sidewalk in addition to that. If this is an idea that you're interested in, you will need to consider the fact that a public utility easement would need to be put into place for this. That public utility easement will allow for you to have new street trees and new street lights that you will have to replace with because for putting in the new sidewalk or bike lane, you will have to remove existing bike trees, lights, sorry, tree lights, trees, and street lights. You'll say, Jeff, why would I want to add an easement in and not move the curb? Fine. The next alternative we have is to change the curb within the right of way. And there are very options that we can do. Simply by moving the curb, we can certainly accommodate bike lanes. We could put a five foot lane on either side, you'd keep and you would have we would then have to create space for the sidewalk. If you do this, you would have to include an easement again to allow for street trees and street lights. This is a normal configuration. But if you choose this, you would lose the opportunity to park cars on the outside lane during off-peak hours. If you're interested in looking at more progressive approaches, you could consider that outside lane being utilized for parking during off-peak. In San Francisco, along the Embarcadero, and here in Lexington, Kentucky, you can see that during peak hours, they've put in a parking tick that is in that outside lane. During off-peak hours, that's allowed for parking for cars. This has a couple benefits. One, it allows for you to have parking during off-peak hours. And two, it allows for you to have a consistent bike lane that's dedicated and always is there. It also provides a buffer for the bicyclist between the bike lane and the moving traffic during non-high-peak non hours. You may say, Jeff, we're not comfortable with that. Is there another option that we could think about where we provide bicycle facilities and parking and we allow for four lanes traffic. And you can do that through a multi-use pathway. Multi-use pathway could be built on the south side of the roadway. This would free up space with moving the curb to allow for an, a constant and permanent parking lane on the north side. This does allow for parking. It does accommodate your four lanes of traffic. It does provide you bicycle lanes and movement for pedestrians. Again, you'll have to consider a utility easement. But the compromise here is that in that multi-use pathway, you only have eight feet to work with. And so you'll have to, what will be compromised is that bicyclists and pedestrians would have to walk side by side with each other. The third and final option that we're presenting tonight is the acquiring right of way for a complete realignment of the street. Now I'm not gonna mince words, this is a big move. This is definitely your biggest move for, because by acquiring right of way, what we're suggesting is that we would acquire property on the south side of Holly Street. That's going to give you a lot of space. And that's going to give you an opportunity to really possibly transform and showcase San Carlos. Again, this is a very big move. And we refer to this as Re Streets approach. A Re Streets approach builds on the ideas of complete streets. Complete streets, as Keith has mentioned, is the idea of building, designing streets so that they accommodate all users, not just the car, but also pedestrians and bicyclists. Restreets takes it a little bit further. Restreets, for more clarification, is based on a coalition of folks, professionals, architects, landscape architects, engineers, city planners, that have come together to think about what streets could be if we were to reuse that or give some of that space back to the people. Cars. Streets, as they are today, take up an enormous amount of our public land. So how can we possibly think of different ways in which we could reuse that street? Tonight, 
And in this exercise, we've looked at possible ways of addressing mobility, access. We've also looked at image and identity for you. But with three streets, we think with the third option that we could actually achieve a lot more. Now I'm going to take you through a few examples just for a minute. And some are going to push the limits. And they're going to be a little bit maybe avant-garde. But I want to just whet your appetite for some ideas. Here we have Octavia Boulevard in San Francisco, California. If we go back far enough, you'll remember that Octavia Boulevard at one time was an enormous interchange or freeway that cut through the city. They tore down that interchange. And they created four, five lanes of traffic. And then by tightening that up, putting it on the ground, they were actually able to create more space that allowed for parks for the community. Octavia Boulevard and the neighborhood around it today has businesses thriving, people have places to play, children have places to be with their family, and it is continuing to thrive. You should also know that Octavia Boulevard, as it functions today, is actually capable of handling 50,000 cars a day, and it still allows for space for people to enjoy, and enjoy their day and play. But it's not just about Octavia Boulevard. What we're looking at with Three Streets is taking the unutilized parts of the road and thinking of ways where we can permanently or maybe even just uh, temporarily reuse them for other purposes. They can be a place for learning. It can be a place for people to relax with chairs and with planting to make a place for people. But we also think with Three Streets that streets can be smart, that they can be an opportunity where we handle our stormwater, cleanse the water that comes off our streets. We can think about it as ways to showcase our community, to show, have public art, and ways for, for us to show how much we care about our children. There is even broader, even more out of bounds ways of thinking about it. In San Francisco, Detroit, other parts of the country, they're actually taking some of the land that is associated with the roads, and they're starting to plant gardens. And they're using that to grow local food. This has many benefits. Not only does it create healthy food for the local people that are there, but it provides a potential economic development piece where it can actually sell food to local businesses, local restaurants, and people can cook. But this idea, this idea of restreets, is not just academic, and it's not just a bunch of uh, uh, people just thinking about what the restreets could be. At MIG, we've actually done that. In this example, we have West Capitol Avenue in West Sacramento. This was seven lanes of traffic and a very inhospitable street. In very in hospital, but people still needed to use it. As you can see in the upper right hand corner, women with children still taking their lives in, in, in their own hands because they need to cross the street for whatever reason. We took Reese Streets and we redesigned that street. We gave it a places for people to go to, for people to play, for people to live their life, to make West Sacramento a much more livable community. If you like Reese Streets, I would invite you to go look on ReeStreets.org. That is the, the website where you can find out much about what we've done here tonight. Now, I've given you a lot of ideas, and I've talked to you about three alternatives, mainly for Holly Street. No curb, a curb change within the right-of-way, or possibly an acquiring of right-of-way for a realignment of the street. But the street, this street in Holly Street, between Industrial Road and between uh, Old County Road, it's not happening in just a bubble. It, it's connected to the rest of your community. And so you need to think about the intersection at Old County Road and what's happening at El Camino Real. So regardless of whatever option you choose when you look at Holly Street, you're going to need to realize that at, at Old County Road, Holly Street is going to widen no matter what. And we need to do so because we need to accommodate the flow of traffic coming off of El Camino Real and coming down from 101 traffic way. But we need to accommodate bicyclists, and pedestrians. No matter what we do on Holly Street, in any situation where you're looking about complete streets or bringing connectivity or whatnot, the intersection is the most important point that you need to think about because that's where you need to address comfort and safety for all users that are there. Here's the existing section for at Old County Road at Holly Street. Again, it's a 60-foot right-of-way, and you'll see that there's four lanes of traffic. Notice that they're 13 and 12 feet wide. We know from study that that obviously is 50 feet. But we know from studying that people, when they are crossing the street, begin to feel unsafe and feel that they are not in a safe environment if they have to walk further than 40 feet. In talking with the team, we know that this intersection, as it widens, 
will need to accommodate seven lanes of traffic. And someone's going to have to cross that at some point. Keep in mind that there are options here on how we can, how we can accommodate that. By tightening up the travel lane from 11, 13 and 12 feet to a 10 foot lane and thinking about where we can reallocate the space that we've gained from tightening up those lanes, we can create a better situation at that intersection. In all cases, we're going to need to think about that 10 foot lane and we're gonna to need to think about ways to make it a comfortable and safe environment for pedestrians and uh, bicyclists. Now, we decided, we showed you two options where there was a multi-use path in alternative two and alternative three. If you think that the multi-use path option is something to consider, then we think that you could achieve a complete street intersection here at Old County Road within a 100 foot right of way. What that's gonna provide for you and what's important to this not just the 10 foot lane, but you're going to need to have this mid block or this pedestrian refuge in the center. This pedestrian refuge, as you see, is six feet wide minimum. This is to allow for a safe haven for someone to stop at as they wait to pass the road. So when the person is standing at the sidewalk on the far right side and they walk, we're only asking them here to walk 40 feet till they meet that pedestrian refuge. They stop and then they only need to walk a 30 additional feet to get the other side. In addition to that six foot pedestrian refuge that we were able to achieve, we're also able to achieve buffers. Buffers between the pedestrian on the sidewalk and the, and the moving cars on the travel lane. So in this case, we suggest that you, in both cases, you could take four feet and create an option that buffers those two people and separates them. It also does a couple of other things. It gives you an opportunity for to put shade trees in. Shade trees provide comfort. They also provide an opportunity for you to create a new identity for San Carlos when you arrive at this intersection. We also see that buffer as a place where you can put your street trees in or put your street lights in and banners. And so therefore you don't need to consider necessarily in this section a public utility easement option. Now, in, in addition to that intersection, we need to think about communal real. In the future, you will have growth. And there is a, a transit village that is coming at San Carlos Transit Village. People will be wanting to walk. They'll be wanting to ride their bike. They'll want to be able to get to Caltrans in those ways other than just a car. In this option that we've shown here, and in many options, the approach that we've taken is to say, all right, we're going to remove crosswalks along El Camino Real and at Holly Street, at the Holly Street and El Camino Real intersection. How do people get across? We provide a pedestrian bridge here that allows people to cross over and get across from the other side. Now, we feel that this option, although it works, we feel that from past experience, people may still want to go ahead and cross Holly Street or El Camino Real where there is no crosswalk. We saw it in West San Carlos and we think it might happen here too. So we would like to suggest that as you move forward and you think about these changes to this intersection, that you consider not only the pedestrian bridge, but that you also think about maybe continuing to keep the crosswalks that you have at El Camino Real and uh, Holly Street. Now with all these ideas, there are costs and benefits that are associated with that. And I'd like to hand this off to Keith so that he can talk to you about that. Thank you. Okay, well, that's a lot to throw at you. I'm sorry, there's so much. It's taken me months to understand what Jeff says. So um, I'm, I'm happy to hear to try and boil it down into a few key parts. Um, Jeff mentioned that the intersections are key. This is, uh, we have uh, inter limited capacity at the intersections. We have three main ones, an industrial Old <coughs> County Road and El Camino Real, all of which are connected. Without doing any of the improve, major improvements, in other words, leaving Holly Street uh, at the existing situation or existing four lanes, we end up a, with a level of service uh, in the D and E range, which is unstable flow operating capacity. That pretty much is what it is today during peak hours. It just doesn't get any better. It can't get any better because we've not made any substantial improvements. By making the larger improvements uh, at the intersections that Jeff talked about, uh, all of those intersections uh, improve to level of service C, which is stable flow with an anticipated reduction in delay of anywhere from 12 to 
over 50% reduction in delay. That's pretty significant for such a short corridor. So it's a, it shows that by, by making improvements, we can get some substantial benefits. This does not go without uh, implications in cost. Uh, for alternative one, no curb change, that goes without saying that, that there are really no right-of-way impacts. We're working with the existing curb, uh, the existing driveways, the existing occupation of the, uh, of the city right-of-way by, by residential facilities as well. Uh, for alternative two, where we do cut into the curb uh, out to the maximum of the 60-foot right-of-way, uh, we would anticipate a cost for public utility easement at 37 properties. Uh, that's not an inexpensive cost, but, it's, but it would allow for those properties to remain uh, and get somewhat of an improvement with the range of alternatives that Jeff had uh, indicated. For alternative three, very significant right-of-way acquisition. This would be the acquisition of 17 single-family residences, six offices, one business gas station on the south side. Uh, that would be east of Old County Road. From Old County Road over to the west, that would be an additional six businesses for, uh, for the improvements necessary underneath uh, Caltrain and those two intersections. So it's a very significant project. Uh, we anticipate the cost for Alternative 1, to which the uh, Public Works Department is planning on implementing uh, later this year, is pretty is minimal at 75 to a little over 100,000. Uh, Holly Street curb change within the right-of-way, which would include a public utility easement and curb changes would be one and a half to a little over two million. Uh, a major acquisition of property as well as a major re street realignment would be 24 to 28 million dollars just for the segment between Old County Road and Industrial and then an additional close to seven to eight and a half million dollars for the segment underneath the Caltrain tracks to improve that. So under a maximum scenario, if you made all the improvements, uh, that would be running 30 to $40 million, a very significant expenditure. So those are the uh, initial range of alternatives. Uh, we suppose that there are some uh, possible variations to those. Uh, we find that any acquisition of right-of-way outside of the existing 60 foot that is currently on Holly Street would cause the residential units to go non-compliant with their setback. So it becomes a problem to acquire any more than, than the existing 60 foot unless you acquire the entire property. And so that's why we sort of made the jump from taking it out to the 60 foot right away to acquiring uh, a full row of homes to do a proper uh, in a large-scale project. So uh, I want to thank you very much for your time tonight, and uh, we look forward to any questions and comments that you may have on any of these alternatives and any direction you'd like to give us. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I can't imagine there are any questions, but on the off chance that there might be a few. Oh, Cameron. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for a great presentation. Um, one question, one main question I have is, so my general perception is that traffic is at its worst in the in the afternoon coming into the city. That's correct. And that um, it essentially backs up against El Camino, that traffic can't flow into El, El Camino either north or south fast enough. Um, and, and so some of that is driven by the length of the lights at El Camino. Uh, and some of it is driven by the number of lanes at El Camino and the fact that you know the um, the road narrows underneath the the berm underneath the train. Correct. So my question is: Is that a um, is that just a blockage point that we're not addressing here? And even if we upstream widen the road, don't we still um, face the same traffic problems if uh, if you can't get enough cars on El Camino fast enough? Absolutely correct. So Jeff alluded to the fact that no matter what we do on Holly Street in the mid-block segment between Old County Road and Industrial, an improvement project would, would, the key improvement project is to add another lane. Uh, from a traffic perspective, we've come up with the concept of taking off 
the pedestrian crossing and replacing it with a uh, overcrossing so that the northbound right turn lane can flow free coming into it mm -hmm. and then adding a third left turn lane to get from westbound to southbound. So this is a, uh, I think I mentioned that cost of doing this work inside this, these two intersections would be six, six and a half million dollars, something of that nature. Um, th this is an essential project to alleviate the PM, <clears throat> the afternoon traffic coming westbound. That is correct. And I mean, in my mind, this may be 90% of the battle. Is that, is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, in that choosing one of the le alternative one or alternative two that would accommodate, uh, better accommodate maybe bikes and pedestrians and not going through the full acquisition uh, would work just as well as long as the intersection was improved. That's correct. Because essentially, even when you realign the street, you're not adding really any through lanes. You don't really need to add the through lanes. The intersections are the problem. That is a, that's a correct statement. And then I, I've come to learn uh, in my short time on the council that uh, El Camino Real is actually Highway 82 and owned and operated by the state of California. It is. And t my understanding is that the traffic lights are also owned and operated by the state of California. And so it's not our under our purview to set the, the timing on the, the traffic lights. Do you, do you think there's gains to be made simply by changing the duration of the traffic lights to allow uh, longer, m more flow, you know, during those peak evening hours? There is indeed, and I believe there's a project that is underway, isn't there, Mr. Public Works Director? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Councilmember Johnson, what uh, the what city staff's been working with a consultant hired through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. It's called the PASS program, and it's to optimize signal timing. So one of the quarters we had them look at was the uh, industrial Holly, Old County, and El Camino corridor, and to see if we have the timing right to optimize for worst times of day and that kind of thing. And so we should be getting the results of that information back in the next within the next month, and then as long as we don't see any fatal flaws with the, the strategy, then we would be rolling out the, the installation of that new timing to help try to um, alleviate some of those concerns. Okay. And so we control our own destiny there, or is it a matter of having a conversation with the state We have to have a conversation country. with Caltrans, yeah. but they're a co-sponsor of this grant program. I okay. So I think we're, and the consultant has had to work with the Caltrans engineers for the timing and other kinds of things right now as well. That's great. So one additional question, then I'll pass it off to my colleagues. Um, on the on the question of bike lanes, um, I, I I support bike lanes, and and um, you know I occasionally bike to work. Um, I have I have tried my to ride my bike over um, uh, across Holly to get to the other side of the, the freeway and to some of the um, bike trails that can go up and down the peninsula there, and that is certainly taking your life into your own hands. I, I wonder um, what you think about the recommendation of bike lanes just simply on this corridor with then no, is, it seems to me that if we were to entertain bike lanes along Holly, that we would want to have a connection over the freeway because that to me is, I mean, it's, it's very, very dangerous to try and get through that cloverleaf on a bicycle. Um, and so I wondered how you thought about that and would it be wise to implement bike lanes unless there was some, uh, option to do that and is it even feasible to put a bike lane through a kind of clover leaf um, on and off ramp? The answer is yes to all of that. Uh, as, you as you may recall, uh, I got to get back to my, sorry, there we go. Uh, if you recall our discussion from September, we are looking at a couple of alternatives of crossing Highway 101 with a separate bike facility. I see. Uh, one that is either an elevated pedest pedestrian bike overcrossing immediately to the south of Holly Street, similar to other bike crossings that, have, that occur right now in other cities along Highway 101. Uh, very similar to one we designed up at Broadway and uh, 101 in uh, Millbrae. And uh, then the other option is also looking at uh, a hybrid concept that winds a bikeway through the loop ramps, uh, which is a little bit more challenged to get a Caltrans approval, but we are looking at both those alternatives going forward. So 
the principal interchange project that we are currently underway with now uh, for the city, right. uh, city sponsoring this project, is to make improvements to the Holly Street interchange plus a dedicated separated bike facility across. Okay. So in my mind, when you consider that, and uh, both the alternatives that we're looking at now going forward would be on the south side of Holly Street going over Highway 101, it makes eminent sense to me that uh, any, al any alternative, including uh, just taking the existing Holly Street right-of-way out, uh, out to its 60-foot right-of-way, uh, Jeff alluded to uh, a concept that would have a bike path on the south side. That seems to me to make a huge amount of sense. If you have a bike path on the south side going over 101, you would also want a bike path on the south side coming uh, down through at least to uh, Old County Road because then you could connect pretty easily to your San Carlos uh, bike corridor uh, right at, at Old County Road. Thanks. That makes a, a lot of sense. That, it was before I joined the council, so I wasn't didn't have the benefit of those discussions. We can come back and do that presentation again, which I think. Thank you, Cameron. Will. Matt. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I'm going to carry on with uh, Cameron's comments to some extent, and I'm just I'm wondering about two things: the wisdom, if you will, of adding bicycles to an already congested roadway. Um, as he alluded to, in the afternoons, especially when you go out there and watch the traffic coming in to town, it's very congested, and you see on occasion a little bit of road rage <laughs> activity, um, most, mostly because of the undefined lanes and people not knowing if this is really two lanes going this direction or just one or whatever, but uh, you do see that. So I, I just wonder about the wisdom of adding bicycles to an already congested uh, situation and also in light of the fact that we're doing the east side connect project which is really intended to make east san carlos avenue the bike boulevard if you will um so uh, just any comment you might have on that well i i think that as time goes on and as the city grows and uh, the community becomes more and more bike user friendly and uh, of greater interest for bicycling. And as you get connections across Highway 101, uh, that'll, that'll sort of dictate uh, the approach that you take on Holly Street. While we, at Holly and 101, we will connect to the east side bicycle project from San Carlos. So there'll be a direct connection to that. Does that mean that nobody will attempt to bicycle down Holly Street? Uh, probably not. There is always a need to have multi-use facilities on, on every street, and we cannot preclude them from driving down Holly Street. Um, so I think that as we go forward, these are very good questions that you bring up. I, I, I really think it depends on your philosophy yeah. about uh, should we really focus on bike lanes and get them mixed in with cars, as other cities have done. Uh, that's a challenging, and, and as Jeff said, it's a pretty progressive uh, way to approach it. Uh, maybe it's not, and that's, that may or may not be right for San Carlos. Yeah. Uh, more of a dedicated bike path on the south side that gets bicyclists outside of the traffic lane uh, particularly when we're trying to build other bike facilities might be a, a better choice. But that's what we want to go out to the public and get those comments as well as, as your comments. It's a, very, it's a very good point that you bring up. Okay. Um, the last council member, Grokot, yeah. if I can interrupt. Just, uh, just to make sure the council remembers, um, it was about a year ago we adopted a uh, complete streets policy for mm -hmm. uh, projects and, and roadway improvements and things like that. So we absolutely will be considering in conjunction with this, the, those different modes of, of, of transportation, peds and bikes and cars. So it's something that we need to look at carefully, and it may not be that we decide to put bike lanes on the streets necessarily, but we want to make sure that we can accommodate the modes and connect them up with the other bike trails and bike paths and things that we already have. Okay. Um, I guess my last question is uh, the, it was mentioned about the intersections. And, and their capacity and so forth. We always think in this country of signalized. 
Has there been any study uh, that much of the roundabout idea at either either end of uh, so so being at Industrial Road and Holly Street or at El Camino, which I understand you know has already been stated is a state highway, so there's perhaps some conflict there. But just uh, just the concept of a of a roundabout. We have not looked at the roundabout at, at this particular intersection. Uh, the issue at, at at least these three main intersections is a roundabout has a certain amount of uh, capacity that it mm -hmm. can handle for for any given movement. Uh, in particularly in the westbound, the westbound to southbound direction, that movement exceeds what you would normally get around a roundabout, you ha you'd have to actually end up with acquiring pretty much a full circle of right-of-way in each corner. Then you've got a mandatory restriction right in the middle of it, which is a Caltrain bridge. So it, it forces you to squeeze down. And so it's a very tight uh, set of intersections to attempt to do a roundabout. Uh, it would be innovative. Uh, there's probably a little bit more room at the uh, junction of industrial to mm -hmm. do that. You still have to acquire a right of way to do it. But again, we have very heavy turning movements. Um, that also, the state right of way also is includes the intersection with uh, industrial, or just to the, sorry, just to the east of the industrial alignment. So that would also require a, uh, uh, Caltrans approval. Um, we're, we're happy to, to look at that. My, my fear on uh, roundabout is that the volumes would be too much and uh, it uh, wouldn't work. Uh, but we've been asked to, we, we actually have been asked in other cities to start looking at it. It's not impossible. Berkeley has put roundabouts at mm -hmm. the end of off ramps. So. Uh, uh, yeah, and I understand, you know, it's a, it's a different way of driving. And uh, I know when I experienced it on my trip to England, at first, it's 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 very disconcerting, but once you get used to it, you've got three lanes of traffic, three lanes of traffic all the way around the roundabout. You just got to be in the right place a, when you want to exit. So it's a, a <laughs> very, it is not a good roundabouts are a great solution for unsignalized automobile traffic. They're not good solutions for pedestrian and bicyclists no. because yeah, you have so true. many points of conflict within the interchange. And it's very difficult to cross. So. Uh, while that's also an innovative uh, style of transportation improvement, it somewhat conflicts with the complete streets approach where you're trying to integrate peds and bikes and, and cars in, into one area because it makes it very challenging to get, it, to get across on a roundabout because of the free flow movements that occur. There's no real stopping of traffic. Well, I, so, I'm not necessarily an advocate. I thought Jeff's presentation was so as progressive, I thought I'd throw it out there to you're see the what, first, what the uh, you're, the, you're the first person to bring it up as an idea, so uh, I think we'll take a look at it, and all, the, all ideas are welcome. All right. Thank you, Matt. Bob? A couple of questions. Um, you mentioned utility easements. Is that difficult to get uh, from our friends at PG&E? Uh, it's the other way around. It's, the, it's acquiring the easement from the property owner and relocating the utilities into that easement. So it's a matter of property acquisition and relocation. Uh, we have uh, relocated and undergrounded uh, streetlights and, and, uh, and power lines in a number of communities, particularly in Menlo Park and uh, Ivy Drive and... Uh, Okay. Uh, very you successful. Don't have it's, to go it's, on. it's not. It's you, not too. It's not. It's not too difficult when we're asking you. It's a, a shorter cost. answer is much better for me. It's okay. a cost. It's a cost. Okay. It's a cost. All right. Fine. Shorter is better, really, because we've got a lot of items to cover tonight. Okay. Um, you said level of service. You had level of service up there. Yes. And the screen you sh you showed said uh, it would be D and E. Correct. But I I thought I heard you say that. It's about that now. It is about so that now. So what's the difference? They, because they're constrained by the intersection. No, but if it's going to be the same. Well, this is without improvement. I understand that. But so, you said right now it's there. It's it, not going to get worse. That's it, what you're implying. That is correct. Okay, so it's not going to go to F. No, because the constraints are, are at okay, due I'm to just, the space. Just asking. So the D, 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 E, D, D 
in 2038 will be the same. It's going to look pretty much the same as okay. it does today. So, I mean, it's not going to get worse. Correct. Which is sort of crazy because like, it's got to get worse because you just said there's going to be a ton more traffic, but that's okay. Uh, south side bike lanes. Uh, are you indicating that, and maybe I misunderstood, that the traffic, would, the bikes would go both ways on that? Yes. Okay. So no, just one bike lane and it would go, they would go both ways? Two way. Two, two way, two -way bike, bike lane. Okay. And Correct. if you could go back to uh, the screen that you just had up there, maybe the next one. Maybe the next one. There you go. Uh, we've indicated right now there's two right-hand turn lanes on El Camino Real going north. So I don't think there's going to be one. There, we've analyzed uh, going to one and dropping. The, the, the constraint there is the pedestrian crossing. So in order to go to one free, free flow lane, uh -huh. free turn lane, uh, this would require construction of that pedestrian overcrossing. Right. So that and you don't have that. Right, I understand. So I'm just saying right now, the council's already discussed if, if and when anything's built at the transit village that we felt that there should be two right-hand turn lanes, not one. There's currently one, two right turn lanes right now. That's those exactly right what I'm saying. Those right turn lanes are signalized. Exactly what I said, uh-huh. And we would uh, suggest that this is a right turn that you can make without being signalized because you're not conflicting against pedestrians crossing there or pedestrians crossing there. I so that flow you. can In other words, go you eliminate the I, I got it. Okay, I got it. So basically, it's a, it's a, even though the traffic light may say red, you just roll through it? Correct. It won't say red. It'll be a green arrow. So you'll have a green arrow. I got it. Okay, I understand that now. Okay, thank you. All right, Ron. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, just a couple of questions. When we, you were looking at uh, showing us alternative three, um, it looks like all the houses on the north side of Holly stay there. Is that right? That is correct. And then it looks like there's a pretty significant bit of parkland that would be between those homes and the road. Correct. And is that, and then there, and they'd actually have, sort of have their own private drive. Is that? Yeah, let me get back to that. Let's see if I can get back there fairly quickly. I mean, that's what it seemed like to me. It looked like a. These slides aren't numbered on my thing, so I'm not really. Okay. Yeah, right there. There we go. All right, so the idea here is that we would acquire uh, and relocate in a very clean alignment because right now you've got this little bend sort of with site distance issue. Right. You'd leave, you'd recreate the existing Holly Street as a private drive with local access and parking on it. Okay. Then you would move the main corridor of traffic uh, for two dedicated lanes and intersection improvements as necessary at, at each intersection. Then in between, there's really, uh, as Jeff mentioned, there's a whole host of options of what you could do in that uh, area. Um, we've also shown that uh, we've left pretty significant buffer on the south side for access to the park uh, and also keeping traffic away from what would, what would become backyard fences of the homes that are to the south of the homes that would be acquired. They would, they would become homes adjacent to traffic, but you don't, so you don't want a bike facility just on the other side of those fences. You'd want to be separated by a green buffer. Okay. Um, and then when I was looking at alternative one, which is basically you don't really do anything except you don't move the curbs, you just make a couple of cosmetic changes. That's correct. And what was a little confusing to me was when you showed the, the results of the traffic. And again, I don't know what, it's not numbered, but, oh, I had it. There's really no it. impact. It shows, well, it showed this big drop in traffic. Is that right? If we just do... Alternative one, or am I, or am I, am I no, incorrectly alter, connecting one the slides? Would, alter, any drop of traffic would be associated with the intersection improvements, either at Industrial or, or Old County Road. Uh, merely, uh, alternative one would not change the traffic level of service or the effects of um, travel along okay, that's Holly in, an, <clears throat> in the mid-block section, correct. All right. Because you had one slide that said benefits and costs, and there's all those green, there's that green shaded area, but right, right below it says alternative one, no curb change. Those two things are not connected? 
alternative one doesn't produce any, only when you build out to the large intersection improvements do you get the do you get any level of service change. That's level correct. of service. That's right. All right. Um, all right, I think that has it and just, yeah, I, I agree on the roundabout. So we, they worked really well in France, but <laughs> it wasn't much traffic. It was out in the country. Correct. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Can I can I just follow up and get a point of clarification? So, would you would you mind going to the slide where it shows the benefits? Just sure. just so I can properly interpret the slide. Sure. Um, it was the one that Ron was alluding to. Keep going. Okay, this slide. So when it says um, we're getting these reductions in delay, mm -hmm. are we to interpret that this is consistent with alternative two and alternative three, or any alternative in which we change the El Camino? Um, any alternative in which you change El Camino or any of the intersections. So if you, in, we widen out industrial with additional lanes, we get a reduction. We widen out Old County Road, with what I showed you there between Old County and El Camino Real, we get that's where you get your biggest reduction uh, at that at Old County Road intersection because we're accommodating quite a bit of turning movement. Okay, but these change. these are at the inter th these don't track to actual alternatives. Is that right? These don't track to actual alternatives. So these are showing the reductions at the intersections. At if we do maximum improvements, but we aren't. We it's difficult to to draw a conclusion about which proposal is gives the best traffic benefit from this is that okay. well because you got two different classes of proposals you got classes of proposal for the mid car intersection right you've got, you've got you can sort of mix and match them you've got classes of proposals for the endpoints the intersections mm -hmm. that's only affected by the endpoints that's correct so in a sense the, uh, you one in a silly extreme one could almost argue the alternatives for the midsection are irrelevant. Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to poke on a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was back to the earlier conversation. So these benefits are maximized by? Intersection improvements. OK. Um, th that's actually a good segue. I, I had a bunch of questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to try and limit them. Um, Jeff, I, I, uh, Jeff Maltby, sorry, since we have several Jeffs involved here. Um, my feeling is uh, this is great. I actually liked some of the out of the box thinking about what Holly Street could look like, um, but I feel like we've we've lost the f the goal of this process, at least in my mind. And he here's what I mean. Um, initially, when I recall the discussions the council had, this was driven by I'm putting this very simply: how do we get more cars through that corridor, that choke point? And I think what I'm hearing now from Keith is that actually the corridor itself is not the choke point. That's not the thing that's the rate limiting factor. It's it's the intersections. Um, That's true. The two Always on the is. west side and the, and the one on the east. So uh, I would almost say that I, personally I'd like to see the analysis and the focus of the, the staff efforts recast to say, okay, if we wanted to, what do we need to do to improve throughput here? I'm particularly concerned also about that, the question that Bob asked, which I had the same reaction, is if traffic is going up 40 percent but the intersection's uh, performance is not degrading, what that tells me is that performance outside of that box that we're studying probably went worse. In other words, th those extra cars are someplace. That's correct. They're stacking they're back stacking onto El Camino or the freeway. That is exactly or, or, right. Right. And, and so the, the issue is, again, in my mind, improving throughput. That's what the goal is. The goal isn't per se to uh, do anything to Holly Street. It's just that if doing something to Holly Street improves the throughput, that's what I want to hear. Um, so just make that as kind of a general uh, observation we can come back to. Um, just one or two little specific questions. Is there any reason why, no, let me phrase that differently. Would there be value in simply not allowing, uh, restriping and not allowing parking along that section of Holly Street at any time during the daylight hours of a weekday? It would get you the same mid-block capacity as, as Spending a ton of money. It okay, be, it, 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 so it's an alternative to it spending is an a ton alternative, of money. which uh, 
which is sort of the basic alternative. It's just restriping and not allowing no parking, parking. Dur during at least you know during well, I th and commute I think hours. Not commute hours. I mean daylight hours. I think, Mr. Walter, if that's probably the, the plan that you the city has in place for later this year is to restripe with with striped visible lanes so people are very clear that there is actually a lane there and restricting parking during peak periods and then back again right we, at, at this point we don't see any reason to restrict the parking further but the idea is that we would uh, be able to provide during those periods when parking is restricted two clear lanes for vehicles to stay in and travel which we think will have some effect on throughput. That'll maximize the space that we've got now. The, the, the uh, additional parking restrictions would have to be studied with volumes on the street and, uh, and whether or not they needed to be extended to more hours during the day. We haven't looked at that as yet. Now, I'm, I'm just going anecdotally, frankly, on both things. Um, I understand about the striping would improve the flow You're, when, when you can feel the cars and you drive through their jockeying, okay? I actually personally feel that if the lanes are too narrow, you're going to see a lot of that jockeying anyway. In other words, it's not just because there's no paint on the road. That probably helps a little bit. But I'm starting to ask a bunch of little questions that I said I wasn't going to. Um, uh, because I, 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 I would like us to move forward to what, if any, follow-on instructions does the dais want to give staff for whether we want additional work done. Well, I, pardon me, I did have one other question. Would flow through this corridor be improved if we started doing things that affected flow west of El Camino? In other words, tried, tried to actually drive more flow up Holly Street up to Elm. Um, so there are less people making the turn, you know, the dog leg onto San Carlos Avenue. We, uh, we took a look at that with, uh, with the forecasted volumes and because of the uh, heavy turning movements that come from El Camino Real that take up traffic signal like a, a green arrow they take up time in that in that uh, intersection actually widening and improving the facility to the west uh, doesn't really do much for level of service as much as uh, let's say adding another lane underneath the uh, Caltrain track and, and getting a triple left turn that will allow traffic. Go, there's a lot of traffic that goes further south than San Carlos. Not everybody does the dog leg. I, I want to re ask the question just because I want to make sure we're we're communicating because I'm almost talking. And I, I have no idea how you would do this. I'm almost talking about a behavioral change. Uh, I moved into that area relatively recently, and uh, uh, I was aware of this idea of potentially using Holly as an, that stretch of Holly up to Elm as an alternative to San Carlos Avenue. And when Al Save first explained it to me, I said, you must be nuts. Why would anybody do that? And I've noticed since walking in the neighborhood, there's actually quite a few people who do it already. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's still not fully utilizing the capacity of Holly Street. So are there things that we could do that would change behavior to sort of induce people to do that, which would then reduce the need for the, turning, the, the proportion of turning movements? Uh, yes, there are. And <clears throat> right now we have a, a, another traffic consultant that's studying improvements, possible improvement ideas on the west side of El Camino. And it actually, it works for flow in both directions, from flow coming down San Carlos Avenue right. to El Camino. We're trying to think of the idea of diverting more of it over to Holly to be able to line up at the intersection instead of having to come down and make the left and then immediately make the right and then going in the opposite direction. So we do have a consultant studying that right now. So it is something that we feel okay. there would be benefit from. Okay. Um, with that, uh, uh, I don't actually have any cards. Actually, I take that back. I do have two cards. Public speakers, uh, Ben Fuller and Dimitri Vandelos. And it looks like I may have a few more. Oh, we got lots of cards. Good. A great study. I think we had a lot of talent um, all put to bear on that, that study. Uh, and also really good questions from council. Uh, I think that um, Councilman Johnson was correct in identifying uh, the major bottleneck is underneath that berm. Uh, and 
what we really want in Greater East San Carlos is a way to get across Holly Street. And so the idea of just making it wider and, and maybe having a, an island in the middle, it's, it's attractive as an alternative method. Um, but it doesn't solve the main problem, which is how do you get across that street? And we know that traffic is going to grow, as Bob correctly pointed out. Um, you know, if traffic's not going down Holly Street, you know, Mark mentioned it'll be somewhere. Um, so we know we need to do something here. Uh, we have a lot of issues that we have to balance when we look at this. Uh, Ron mentioned parklands. That's one of the issues. But we also have, you know, folks, this is, uh, this is, low-cost housing in San Carlos. You know, there aren't a lot of places to go if you want to have your own home. Um, we represent Holly Street. We care, you know, we know it's a different situation on there, but we care a lot about, you know, what those folks are doing and, and whether they're able to stay in their homes. Where else are they going to go? So it's, it's, it's crucial to uh, take care of these guys. With that said, you know, there is going to be growth. And so the simple bang for your buck, it sounds like it's six million bucks. And I, did that include the, uh, the, the overpass or was that just, so six million bucks gets us an overpass and gets us additional lanes. I mean, it, it sounds like the biggest no brainer in the history of mankind. Um, and it still allows us to keep those homes on Holly Street. And, um, you know, maybe we won't get all the, all the things we wanted, but, you know, I, I don't envy the situation all you guys are always in. And yet another example of, of living difficultly, but, you know, as Bob always says, you can split the baby maybe, and maybe that's the way to do it. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Ben. Dimitri? <clears throat> uh, followed by Bonnie McClure. Hi. A um, couple of things. Um, I want to question some, uh, one of the key assumptions in, in the study, which uh, talks about 40% growth on the, in traffic on the freeway. Um, if we get 40% growth on 101, that's essentially permanent gridlock. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's what we should be planning for. Um, and I, I don't see how that would be sustainable. Um, and um, I, don't, I don't think that's a true uh, rep uh, representation of, of what we need to do to solve some of our problems. Um, so it's difficult because, it, I mean, there's some very interesting ideas. You know, that are floated out, um, and some are uh, incredibly painful for uh, quite a number of residents to our community. Um, but you know, clearly, <laughs> you want to do the simplest thing. Um, so it seems that just restriping for four lanes, keeping things as they are, and uh, doing a, a, um, a, a, a Iterative approach, that's what we do in software development. We do iterative approaches. We do a change. We see what happens. We tweak it. We see what happens. That makes a whole lot more sense than some gigantic plan where we redo things. Uh, I, I, I thought it was humorous that there were seven lanes of traffic in one of those slides, you know, one on eight, you know, maybe, maybe ten. Um, uh, I, I feel that if, if we went uh, in that direction, um, uh, I, I would lose my hearing. Uh, for permanent uh, construction, uh, given all of the projects that are going on. So um, I think let's keep this conversation going. I think that when we talk about traffic in San Carlos, we do have to look at it from a holistic standpoint. What's going on with Crestview Interchange? That was something that was proposed in 1992. Uh, a, a, a freeway access off of 280 is another way to get in and out of San Carlos. Seems like that. that's a, a way overdue. Um, uh, right now, when I go uh, on 280, I have to take Ralston. We're only creating more and more traffic along Ralston. Um, so I, I think, you know, if, if we're trying to funnel all the traffic through Holly Street, I think that's crazy. A uh, couple of other things, mixing bikes and cars. Dimitri, how much more time do you think you um, need? I'm pretty much, um, just a couple of things. Mixing cars and bike lanes is a really bad idea, frankly. Um, uh, if, if, if we went for this, that gigantic uh, uh, approach, you know, clearly there'd be money to, to have a dedicated bike lanes. Um, and, and I think the key thing is, is what you guys have brought up earlier, it's those choke, choke points in the intersections. That's where we really have to focus the study um, and, and, and look at it that way. So, you know, that, that's what I, uh, all I have to say, but clearly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of the small incremental change um, rather than the, the, the gigantic plan that's going to cost a fortune and displace uh, uh, folks who, who live in the most affordable section in the community. Thanks. Bonnie McClure, followed by Nancy Zebergs.
Thank you for allowing the public to speak to this in your work, work section. Uh, Bonnie McClure, uh, representing myself. <laughs> uh, the alternate three, uh, I think, is an interesting uh, proposition, and it could really lead to a beautiful parkway entrance to San Carlos. However, I think some some uh, changes on it could be made. I, I see that there would be a big improvement for the houses on the north side of Holly, having their own parking and access to their houses. And I think that the bike lane uh, on that side of the street could be incorporated into that space instead of be allo allowing it to go along as the modern complete streets uh, um, attitude is taken. Uh, so buffering the bike lane there. And of course then the pedestrians would have that nice green space too. It would mean on the south side that the a uh, few homes that are there would be lost. I would hope that the city would be generous with trying to find housing for those people as they should. And um, the thing is that the park there, Loyola Park, that space behind where you would need the, spa the extra space for the rear of the houses would be on the south side, could also be space for the bike lanes and pedestrians <coughs> through a green space because you could have a linear park extending from Loreola in that space. So I would like to see that examined. And uh, I agree with your remarks, uh, Councilman, that uh, the intersections are important. But I think when you look at the long-term advantage of having a, a beautiful entrance to the San Carlos, that that counts for something too. Partic but think about buffering those bike lanes and pedestrian lanes. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Nancy Zebergs, followed by Rita Fusano for Sorrow. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, again, I, I appreciate the chance to be able to, to speak um, as a resident in the um, on Springfield Drive right there next to Holly. Um, we have talked about re-striping Holly Street um, <laughs> for a long time, and I think that is an excellent beginning. I've noticed that in uh, several communities you see a lot of signs that say, um, you know, be careful of your speeding, it's going to be down. There are more cautionary signs and so forth. If you are not going to be stick, restrict uh, daylight parking, any further than it already is on Holly Street. After the restriping, having signs up to let motorists know that are not familiar with our community, that parking is permitted on the curb lanes between these hours, so they're aware because as you go down the street, you see people pull up behind a parked car and go, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> there's no room. But the, the restriping is, to me, the best the best start to it. Beautifying our city, always, always a plus. There isn't any reason that to beautify that area without going to option three. Um, look at the underground for the utilities and so forth. And that in itself would give room for additional trees and so forth without changing Holly Street as it is. But if it is determined to go to a further extent as an option three, and again, I agree with you, is that if those 17 houses, the people that are, I hope they are adequately compensated and a good deal of effort is put into helping these people find houses because they've been there a long time. We've been there 30 plus years, so um, that makes a big difference. But if the land is, is taken on the south side of Holly Street, I don't see the reason that Holly needs to be straightened, necessarily. Why not leave the extra space on the south side to extend the park? I mean, we've talked about improving Loreola Park and adding to the park uh, side. Excuse me, how much more time do you think you'll, okay. Not much. Um, but to keep it on that side 
and instead of adding to the north side and i think that could beautify but i will um also agree with the fact of concentrate on the intersections if the roadway itself is not going to make any difference we're not expanding the size of the roadway concentrate on the intersections and improve those and then see what we have to do with holly street itself thank you okay so um actually has uh, nancy no nope. oh, nancy yes you just finished speaking sorry no, see i thought I told you it was nancy you're confusing me no you confuse me look, look toward this direction not that direction, that direction. Yeah, i'm going to do that direction. from now on um uh, I have one more card. Uh, Rita Fasaro. Fasano? Fasaro. What was Nancy's last name? Nancy's last name was Seabergs. Hi there, Mayor, Hi. Council. Um, so I'm a resident of Holly Street. I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, it's an awesome place to live. It's not, in and of itself, it's a community. So I think I came before this council when I first moved here and was just so touched by how warm everybody on that street is and how, you know, the neighbors are with each other. So um, having said that, I, you'll probably guess I'm not a fan of <coughs> option three. But um, I just would like to speak on two issues. And um, one is the mixing of bikes and cars on Holly. I, I'm very worried about that. I think especially if you start uh, uh, painting the lines and creating these 10 foot lanes, which I think is what the size of the lanes were on Doyle Drive, on the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge, where it was, it's a challenge because I don't think that's really the regulation size for a lane. I think they're supposed to be a little bit bigger, but that's the minimum they can be. So you're going to be creating minimum requirements already so it's and and that's okay I don't think driving is supposed to be a idiot proof thing nothing you know it'd be nice if it was but we all have to do due diligence on the road so I don't advocate adding a bike link to what will all already be a kind of challenging thing but I will say having lived there I do believe that would be a huge huge help I think that's a huge factor people don't know what's going on and I don't and the other woman that spoke is right. People think that the parked cars are a lane. And by the way, if you are parked there during regulated hours, regardless of what the traffic's like, even getting out of your car, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I had a bus honk at me already, you know, and that was just like during, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's kind of, it, that whole thing is kind of challenging. So the bikes added to that is just like, uh, I like the idea about the bikes going around maybe through the park. That seems kind of nice, you know, a little bit better. And um, and then one last thing on the traffic lights and, and, and trying to time those. Uh, I think that might be a good idea, but I see a lot of us on Holly in the morning trying to get out, and we it's nice at their time that they both stop at one time because it gives us that, like, okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> and we can get out of our homes and you see like a mul you know you see c a combination of people trying to do I mean it's kind of nice that they're stopped for just even a little bit we exercise and have learned patience and wait for that and kind of accommodate and by the way Holly Street I don't know what the big deal is about everybody being hung up on traffic on Holly Street that's such a short little street oh my god if you ever get hung up on San Thomas Expressway or Lawrence Expressway or Van S Avenue I mean come on this is a little thank, tiny thank street. you Rita I need You're you to wrap up <laughs> thank you all right um, any other speakers okay thank you um, as I mentioned uh, before we took public comment um, I, I do want to uh, uh, move to wrap this up but in the context of giving direction for what, if any, future work we want staff to do um, from the dais. Uh, in, in the interest of uh, just putting up a straw man there to see if we can, we can get a, uh, some consensus on a direction to go in, um, I'd like to propose that, that we ask staff to um, uh, go back and uh, do some additional work with the goal being coming back with some alternatives uh, specific alternatives on uh, things that we could do and the cost that would be involved in doing them to improve the throughput through this area. Um, and, uh, and 
with the caveat that if this area needs to be expanded a bit so that it makes sense from the point of view of the analysis and the options, that's this issue of where all the extra car is going to be, um, that they do that. Um, but I'd like to see a little bit more of that. It, it's not that, that uh, I thought the rest of the presentation was very useful, but for me, the primary reason to have this discussion is to think about ways to improve throughput. And, and uh, if there aren't any reasonable ways to do it, then fine, we're done with the exercise. Uh, what do people feel about that? What's the reaction about that? I, I, the way I would put it simply is it sounds like we're going to be doing the restriping. So I think we yes. do that. And I'm not interested in buying out anybody's house. Uh, so option three for me, while it looked nice, is not, not something I, I'm willing to do. Um, but similar to what you're saying, I think, is I, I'm more interested now, after hearing and having this study, how do we improve the intersections at uh, either end? And uh, you know, it'd be nice to make the street look nicer <coughs> as part of a project. But otherwise, I, I think the, the emphasis should be, how do you improve the intersections at either end to okay. get the throughput you're looking for? Other comments? That um, yeah, I, I, I kind of like Dimitri's comment, do it and do an incremental approach. I like the restriping because that might solve some issues that uh, uh, are there now. Um, and it'll give it, it's a good test, and it doesn't cost a lot as far as I know. Um, personally, I really like Alternative 3, but that's $40 million, so we'll save that for another day. But uh, I like going down the path of the this incremental approach and see where that takes us. Uh, so I, I agree with um, a lot of what's been said. I agree that the, the goal is to increase throughput. I mean, we're going to have a discussion in a minute about the citizen survey, and one of the big issues that came out of the citizen survey is traffic. So um, that being said, we, we do have some information about, you know, at least a proposal for what it would look like to reconfigure um, the El Camino uh, section. I guess is the is your proposal that we would look at, come back and look at some other alternatives to, to what's been proposed for that intersection? Or I, I'd actually like to see um, a little bit more focus on those proposals. I'd like to have a little bit more understanding of of uh, uh, um, what what in fact they will buy us in terms of improved traffic and again the, one of the biggest things that's lurking in the back of my mind is the issue that bob and i were were touching on which is if if it's true that we're looking at 40 percent more cars where, where are they in other words the the are there other areas near here that that need to be addressed in order to improve the throughput through the whole area um and and i just i mean um uh I'm not even sure how much additional work there is relative to what was presented tonight. It might just mostly be repackaging and refocusing it. But it, I, I didn't find a lot of this information sufficiently clear that I could say, yeah, okay, that's what I want to do. Other than things like the restriping, which to me are, are almost a no-brainer. And what do you think? I mean, so so I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I guess the question is, what do you think about um, moving towards Looking at feasibility and costing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, well, I, I would ex uh, I would expect that to be part of what okay. what comes back because I mean I, I don't want to just deal with this as an abstract issue. I want to say okay, right. so, so for so X dollars, that's I get my y concern benefit. is how do we move toward if we're if we're moving to the, that we don't we don't sort of repeat the same conversation that we move towards something that looks like some action. Yeah, 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 and and. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm more than willing to entertain doing bigger things. I mean, um, uh, I have a little bit different perspective than I think Matt offered. Uh, I, I don't want to buy anybody's house if it's not going to make a significant impact on throughput. If, it, right. if, it, if that potential is there and that's one of the things we need to do to improve th throughput, and that's, then I'm certainly willing to consider that. Not saying we'd do it, but I'm certainly willing to consider it. But that, that's my focus is how do we improve the throughput of the traffic? Because, as you said, I, I think that's the thing that everybody's mostly concerned about. Right, exactly. Any other, Bob, do you want to? No, I, I think you ought to start the basics, just like I find myself agreeing with Dimitri too many times this year already. But, but uh, Well, the year's young. You can, yeah, you can, you can see the change. But uh, start with that. And then, uh, and, you know, and again, you brought up the point, and I guess I missed it, but I certainly got it pounded into me, that we can do nothing 
and it doesn't make any difference right? <laughs> if we don't get those intersections squared away. And unfortunately, you've got Caltrans on one side and, and well, Caltrans on both sides, plus the fact that we're trying to redo the, the clover leaf. So you've got huge amounts of, I think those are where the two areas that, as you mentioned, we need to go. And I, I tend to agree with Matt that I'm not necessarily, I mean, you'd have to drag me kicking and screaming to take somebody's house, especially unless you can, I mean, you could show me B's up there instead of D's, and I don't think you can. So uh, I, I think the, 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 the intersections are the key, and, and let's try that incremental striping. And, and uh, I don't necessarily think that bikes and cars are going to get along, but I wouldn't be adverse to somehow possibly taking some right away uh, with the public taking some folks right away and making a separate bike lane, possibly. But I think that's the next step, not this step. This step is let's do that the thing and trying to get some intersection information back. Okay. Uh, Jeff, is that some sense? you have some sense of what we're trying to ask you to do next? I do. I, th I think we can uh, take that feedback and uh, prepare some uh, recommendations for the City Council moving forward. Great. Very good. Um, then we will move on to item 10B. Or do folks want to take a brief? Do you want to take? You're good? Okay. Um, I, I just saw Bob get up, so I, I want to take my coat off. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I don't think we paid our cooling bill. I don't think we paid our cooling bill. Yeah. yeah. Um, in charge of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you in charge of the building? <laughs> so, uh, 10B study session on the adult community center. Christine. Glad I didn't wear a tie. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council, and public. Christine Boland, Parks and Recreation Director. If you recall, about a month ago on February 24th, the Council requested to hold a study session on the Adult Community Center to review the existing facility conditions, what's needed there, and also to hold a broader discussion on replacing the center with a new community center, what that would cost or what that would look like, um, what it could look like and what that would cost. So I'll start with some background. Let's see what happened to my. There we go. Um, I keep doing that. Okay. Um, start with some background. So the facility located behind us, basically on six at 601 Chestnut, um, it's built in 1982. Uh, it's open uh, ever since that day, that year. Uh, it's open Monday through Friday, nine to five for classes, lectures events and of course weekend rentals receptions and most recently our wonderful crab feed by the friends we've had few improvements since the opening roughly um, some flooring replacements and a roof about three years ago um, and if you recall last month the proposed um, remodel project that i brought to you was a, it's um, 1.6 million for a remodel and it's currently in the capital budget this year's budget so let's talk about uh, existing conditions over there. We've got um, some damage from roof leaks over the years. We've got some cracks um, that involves um, interior, a lot of exterior issues as well. We've got about 200 items on an ADA list on our transition plan. Several um, pretty um, comprehensive mechanical issues with the systems there. And the facility is basically outdated and very worn. Very loved, but very worn. Um, just showing you as quickly, I've condensed our, uh, from our civic facilities master plan, about 25 pages down to about four or five slides here. So park view room um, issues, leaking in the patio room. Uh, many of these deficiencies are due to a failed roof system years ago, which haven't been addressed yet. Arts and crafts room, this is still there. Uh, broken skylight, as I mentioned, we've got um, ADA issues, Americans with Disabilities Act. We do have a transition plan addressing these items, but it's um, restrooms. Uh, the accessible restroom um, has um, inefficient counter heights and different issues with the commodes. The second floor restroom is not ADA accessible at all. Doorknobs are the wrong type for the building, according to the ADA. And then we've got <clears throat> many issues with um, barriers to travel, accessible travel paths. The 
This is one of the prettier pictures of the building. This is our mechanical room with some uh, issues with the boiler. It's past its useful life. Um, other HVAC um, items, which are um, pretty much ready to go at any time. So the question you had last month was, what's the most critical issue to, at the ACC today? When on its face we go into the building, it's very inviting, it's very um, warm, cozy, lots of activities going on. And if you boil it down, I would say it's a mechanical system. So it's really the HVAC, the cooling tower, and the boiler, as I just mentioned. So to limp along, um, we need a few bucks in the budget. But um, with the new roof, I would say you know the the building is it's it's safe and secure, but it, it's it's got a lot of um, needs a little powder and paint, if you will. So there was some talk a couple years ago about a possibly just conceptualizing a new community. Uh, center. Um, just to fam familiarize you here with this, this is um, City Hall, parking lot, and library, and uh, adult community center on the corner here. This is an apartment building and another adjacent apartment building and City Hall Park. So in this red area here, it's about 89,000 square feet. The um, Former Parks and Recreation Director contracted with uh, Nolan Tam in 2012 for a couple of concept conceptual drawings. Um, this uh, conceptual drawing contains um, a new community center, assuming property acquisition, um, underground parking, which is uh, sorely needed in this facility, in this civic center area, and uh, with an aquatics feature. So this material is contained in your packet and it shows the um, current site which is Chestnut and San Carlos Avenue two-story building another view um, I, I'm assuming this is looking west and an interior showing the lobby with uh, not calling it an adult community center but proposing a community center and aqu an aquatics complex and uh, community room this is an interior um, of the lobby, I'm sorry, the um, second story concept with uh, gym equipment showing a lap pool in the foreground and a kitty rec pool in the background. Um, unlike Jay Walters, my presentations are quick and I don't have the use of a consultant. So you just have me. So in conclusion, the, uh, a new community center would involve a bond issuance, there's no doubt, unless you have a hidden 50 million that I could use. Uh, it's, a it's a ballot measure. Um, it would include property acquisition, of course the underground parking, aquatics, roughly just, you know, a rough estimate, guesstimate, 20 to 60 million. Operating costs I took from our neighboring City, Redwood City, which has a large community center with an aquatics provision, it, they're running about a million dollars annually. And then I also took our adult center currently, which is about um, 350 a year and 350 a year, and I tripled it. So that, that's a very rough estimate, but it gives you an indication of what it would cost to, to run a large center. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer uh, questions, and we also have staff from the adult center. Anna Curtell and Linda Scannell here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions? Matt? The only question I have is uh, when we're showing the aquatic center and you're throwing in the operation cost, is, yes. that, keep, is that taking into account uh, like, you know, some type of membership fee or anything like that, or are you just thinking? Um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. Okay. So there would be revenue from the facility, and the, um, I'm sure there's a large contingency of swimmers in the, in the area. Um, having had a membership at the Pacific Athletic Club a few years ago, there's a lot of swimmers in this yeah. area, so I'm sure they would be interested in this type of lap facility. Okay. Um, Bob? Yes, a couple of questions. Um, According to the staff report, one of the alternatives is to proceed with the approved 2012-2014 capital improvement budget calling for remodeling of the existing center. So in the staff report, there's $167,000 for a study uh, for design services. Correct. It's in the budget. 
And then is the 150,000 to fix the uh, um, um, boiler or whatever, is that in the budget? Or the HVAC, whatever it is? That is not in the budget. Okay, so what is in the budget besides the $167,000? The, um, the $167,000 was to bring on an architect right. to help us get through a community project process and similar to the library project. So, so let me let me let me ask you. Design, I, I guess design. I'm confused. So of course that's not unusual. Okay. Um, so what we're talking about is bringing on an architect for $167,000 to look at remodeling what we have or to build the new thing. Remodeling what we have, and okay. that was last month's proposal. Okay. You wanted to talk about a larger concept, which is great. I think it's uh, worthy of that. But um, last month was bringing. Um, bringing the consultant on board, designing the re remodeled facility. So, so the facility itself was built 32 years ago. Right. A lot of rooms are too small, too right. large, too awkward, and so we're envisioning moving a few walls, cleaning the place up, okay, so, and addressing So ADA. I guess I'm trying to identify, we bring in this company, they do some proposals. We may or may not do what they propose, but we we, we brought them in, okay, mm -hmm. this council meeting. We don't have the money to fix the mechanical or HVAC, at least it's not in the budget. I'm not saying we don't have the money. What is, and, but then you showed a bunch of pictures that a lot of work needs to be done. So I'm we're sorry. saying we're not going to do any of that work until we get <laughs> no, the proposal? That, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. That work it, would be included in the 1.6. Yes. Yes, we'd, we would have to. I, I, I'm, so, I'm missing yeah. the 1.6 you're saying here. I apologize. Okay, All so I'm getting is $167,000. If originally. I may, through the mayor. Yes. Yeah. We have a, a $1.6 million capital improvement project budgeted for the facility. That's what I'm trying to that, identify. It's not in the it, staff report, and, and I apologize. I right. could have asked this. Ahead because of time. This, is a, this is a different sort of issue. When we came forward a few weeks ago to the city council, we were prepared. We had a recommendation on the consultant selection to do the design work. Okay. So if that project goes forward, the $1.6 million process, we'll hire that consultant, work with the, the, uh, the facility operators, our staff, and the community members who utilize the facility to identify exactly what that design looks like. Part of that will include a number of you know mechanical type problems that the building has that our facility master plan has already identified in the facility, things like the leaking and the boiler and those kinds of things that we know have to be included in this $1.6 million project. Now as that project was about to come forward, this notion that we talked about actually a couple years ago of this larger concept was floated back up and the council said, you know, before we pull the trigger on the 1.6, yeah. let's take a look at the bigger concept. It's coming back to me slowly. That's okay. where we are. I apologize. <laughs> Not a problem. But you got a lot I in front of you I just want to make sure we understand what we're doing here. So we're either going to commit, we could do both, I guess. We could commit to spend the money and also look at the bigger project, although it would seem like that might not be the greatest idea we ever had. But having said that, it would seem that we want to maybe uh, take some, if we want to go to a bigger project, we'd still want to take some of that 1.6 and fix what we got to fix. I mean, just to... You know, I don't know what it would be, $100,000, $200,000 to do all the stuff that we need to fix. Mm -hmm. At and least it, not necessarily the mechanical end of it, but certainly the other parts of it. Right. And, and uh, uh, Ms. Boland's presentation pointed out that you would need to spend about $150,000 to triage the building okay. if you were, say, planning to go to the voters in a year or two years at the most. You could limp the that, building I along. see that here, and I just I misunderstand. I misunderstood. I thought it was just for the mechanical, and I guess I misread that. So I thought that was just for the mechanical. It's not. It's for the triage of the building. But it doesn't necess does it necessarily include the mechanical? It does. It does. Okay. It would just limp us along. At, at a minimum. Okay. Right. I understand. It's it's band aid band -aid band -aid fixes okay. until okay. you decide or until the public voted on a measure to build a larger okay. facility. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Through the chair. Oh, you are. I know. I'm just kidding. Just trying <laughs> to see if you're awake. Um, <laughs> the. Um, I just want to follow up on that uh, before we move on to other questions. So, because I had interpreted to the $150,000 number as being just the uh, HVAC system, yeah, not cool. like the cracked skylight and the, the ADA non-compliance and stuff. So the $150,000 really fixes all that stuff? Okay, that's just, what I want to clarify. I just, no, no, that's, that's yeah. why we're having the discussion. I think it's a good question. So I was asking for 
An estimate of 150 because when something goes, it's going to be expensive. Okay. <laughs> so it's a Band-Aid approach if you wanted to go to the ballot and um, for what it's route. for what it's worth. So. What what I was hoping to get a sense from, and, and you guys may know this it, off the top of your head, roughly, is if, for example, I I wouldn't necessarily look at hiring an architect to think about moving walls. Right at this point, because we haven't, because personally, I would rather us flesh out the bigger project first and decide whether we want to do that. But I would like to make sure that we fix the plumbing and the crack skylights and the 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 chiller pump or whatever it is, um, because it seems to me that m most or all of that stuff, unless we knock down the building, um, which I know we might, <laughs> um, we're going to want to do. Mm -hmm. And and if we don't do it. Then it's going to be. Wouldn't it be more, much more expensive if you know a few months from now we go? Oh well, we dreamed really big and we decided we're not going to do that now. Now we got to go back and do this other stuff. Well, I think you know the way I think of the the original project. If we could go back to that, is it? It's a full scale remodel of the facility. You know, so to do that, we're going to want to work with a professional to you know engage the community, talk about the not you know the type of programming that's happening there the type of programming that could be happening if the facility was slightly different and all that gets incorporated and packaged with you know the mechanical the HVAC the leaks those things that are going to need to be corrected some of it may naturally be corrected uh, just through the reworking of the facility others are going to be specific like the HVAC system uh, and it's you know something where I don't think we want to end up with a project where we're putting in an HVAC system and then we're making a significant modification to the building, not the brand new building, but a, a modification of the existing building that's going to cause you to have to take out that kind of work. So I think from my perspective, we really need to decide, do we want to invest $1.6 million into this facility or do we plan on replacing this facility entirely with a brand new facility? Uh, and if so, how soon? If we're talking 10 or 15 years, then by all means, invest the $1.6 million. If we're talking two or three years, then the investment that you need to plan on making is probably 150000 may go up to a quarter of a million. You know, if we lose the HVAC system in its entirety, we want to still be able to operate the building comfortably for our customers and our residents. Um, you know, but that's the kind of scale that we see at the staff level in terms of, you know, what we're looking at in the shorter term versus, you know, a longer term plan. So it's really, do you want the big project or? Yeah, that, that clarifies a bit for me. Ron. I, I just had an idea. Um, I realized 150000 fixes the HVAC. What, what about some sort of an interim budget where we would approve X amount of dollars, two, 250000 or up to 250000 to take care of, of the things that, could go wrong, might go wrong over the next few years while we decide whether or not we can do a big project. That's the 150. That was it. A... That's just the. 100. Yeah. I thought that was just the HVAC. I thought. Well, the HVAC HVAC is we limping it. along right now. Yeah. It could go any day, and when it does, we could spend 150 thousand dollars on it just to it's just to budget. repair it, yep. and that would not be a long-term fix. Uh, and so we see that money as the triage money for things that could break. All right. So there wouldn't you don't believe that there would be much value in budgeting an amount over that for something else that might happen in the interim. I, I think the dollar amount that we're talking about is so small relative to the city, another hundred thousand that if we needed it, we would simply come to the city You'd council just come and back ask. To us. Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, or do, is it following immediately on that, or or is it? No, it's okay. Okay, Cameron. Um, thanks, Christine. Um, the the presentation feels a little bit like we're replacing the adult, or the, like there's a proposal to replace the adult community center with a pool, but it's not exactly that. Is that right? I mean, is there a, a lot of the functionality that we have in the adult community center today would be carried forward right. in a new facility? Oh, absolutely, it would be. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that, and is there anything that would be lost um, in the existing functionality of the adult community center that in in a in a potential new facility? So, not not being here at this time in this position, I'm at a loss um, as to what this all included, and I don't have much of a background into what this consultant was thinking mm -hmm. back a couple of years ago. So. I don't imagine um, it would be um, eliminating anything we have now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of rooms, programming rooms, uh, banquet rooms. So it would be adding to the facility 
and um, it's roughly a uh, you know two story. Uh, so gosh, a way to think about it size. is it's it's augmenting the existing yes. services that we offer and bringing in new things like an aquatic center. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thanks. Okay, Matt. I guess I'm still confused. So um, the, the this idea going you know grandiose means the existing building gets torn down? Correct, yes. Oh, and, and so that was going to be, uh, I, I don't know that we can make this kind of discussion right now, but uh, I, I would be curious in looking at or giving direction, I guess, to staff to how, how do you um, do something bigger, including perhaps an aquatic center, but maintaining the existing building, even if it meant gutting the entire thing, but you keep the shell of it. I just, you know, it's an it's anathema to me to think about tearing down a perfectly good building and throwing it in the landfill, <laughs> which is essentially what you're doing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very nice structure. It's nice architecture. It's got good bones. Um, you know, I, I I see remodel potential for something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, still getting an aquatic center or whatever, and, and, and I guess the aquatic center might also require. I couldn't remember. Uh, I remember Mr. Maltby bringing it to us at a council retreat when it was just Mr. Maltby and the city attorney and the council. That kind of retreat, it was brought to us. Um, if that included purchasing some of the properties around, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so you know, if that's the case. Then I don't see why, if once you can purchase some of those other buildings around, even if it's one or both, why doing a remodel couldn't be a possibility. And then we're not throwing good money after bad if we do the up, the mechanical upgrades. I, I I'm sort of inclined to go with the direction that I think uh, Mr. Collins was talking about, where we up the amount from 150, which is saying if something breaks, you can spend up to 150. I saw a bunch of things in there that need fixing. They're already broken. So perhaps we up the amount, I guess, when we're looking at the budget this year mm -hmm. and say, hey, we'll, get, you know, we'll try to budget 250 and then you can fix the skylight, you can fix some of these leaks, you can fix the mechanical system. And then my last comment would be this, that if we hire an architect to look at this whole scope, I think one of the things we may find is that your mechanical systems. I know in my business, mechanical systems that you replace are often so antiquated, you actually find space because, like, for instance, a hot water heater, nobody uses them anymore. You use a manifold system. It goes between two by six studs. It's not a lot of space, but you've found something. So, you know, boilers and those kinds of things, I don't know. I don't do the commercial side of things, but there might be something to be had there. Let's, um, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, we'll take the public comment that we have and then have some discussion, think about direction to give to, to staff. Thank you, Christine. Okay, thank you. So um, first up is Patty Brown, followed by Elizabeth Torres. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Patty Brown. I'm president of the Friends of San Carlos Adult Community Center, which is the fundraising end uh, for the center. And we've done quite a few projects over there all, already in the years that they've been operating, really since close to 1982 when, the, when this center was built. And um, I'm here to support a remodel, basically, for, from the friends and many of the uh, clients that we have today at the center. Um, we understood that there was $1.6 million in the budget for this coming two years for us to start on that remodel project. And the fear is that if we look, start looking again at a bigger scope of something, we're just pushing all of the problems that we have today down the road for who knows how long. I don't know how long it takes to get a measure on the ballot and to do all those kind of things that you would need to have some big remodel. But I agree with Councilman Grocott 
and several of the others that the place has good bones and it's in good shape physically and uh, structurally and that if we just do the tweaks that we need to do and consider doing the mechanical things that we need to do and fixing leaks and maybe adding new a few new furniture pieces you know it's a very viable viable building and so in support of going for more remodel than a grand scope or even looking at keeping that building and building these other complexes and facilities that we might want in a different close by location like the park or whatever would be a better alternative um, I do think that uh, $150,000 is not enough if that's just going to fix the mechanical side of it for the heating and air conditioning, which we do need. And um, so I'm a little confused as to why we talk about 150 and 1 1.6. And I would like more clarification on that kind of thing. If 1.6 is already in the building, in the budget, I'm like, let's go <laughs> and, and get that done. So. Thank, Thank you. you, Patty. <laughs> um, next, as I mentioned, is Elizabeth Torres, followed by James Peters. San Carlos is my town. I've lived here over 50 years. And I know it's not very much, but we have put over $17,000 into that facility. Uh, also, we put ourselves in. My husband was president of Friends. I am at the moment a cashier. And I must commend these two ladies who run that place. They've been the best since we've had an adult center. They are marvelous. And so I would like to see the improvements. Hopefully, the center won't be closed too long because we not need to get back there. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, James Peters. Oh, he left the room. Now, do we know if he's coming back? OK. Uh, we'll, we'll have him address the council after uh, he returns. Um, well, the, uh, I think the, the the question before the council is what direction uh, do we wish to give staff in terms of moving forward um, and without trying to limit you know, the options that are, are what we could tell them, uh, it sounds to me like it roughly boils down into proceed along with the remodel, the, let me call it the full remodel, um, or do something substantially less, whether it's 150 as recommended by staff or some high, somewhat higher number uh, that people in, in individual, the individuals in the dais have indicated they might support. Um, presumably, that would be accompanied by directions of staff to go off and uh, uh, flesh out the bigger uh, picture option. Um, and I will just mention a personal comment here. I actually thought that, Matt, you had a good point about if we can figure out a way to uh, reuse the, the facility that's there, um, that sure seems like a better idea to me than, than not. Um, so I think that's kind of the range of things. Mr. Peters, you're here. Yes, good. I was, I was stalling for time for you, so. Um, I'm sorry, I, it's all right. No, don't worry when about it. At my age, you, you have problems. I, <laughs> but you, you, um, you can be any age. <laughs> okay. On the question of the aquatic center, I think it would disrupt a community. We've come to uh, be dependent on the uh, the center as it as it is, I'm thinking if you're going to have an aquatic center, it'd be better if you if you would put it someplace else. Maybe Brit what is it, Britton Acres Park? That's around Elm Street, and uh, that would be a better. There's a rec center there, and I think if you were to expand that center. And it seems to be the place where more of the community goes anyway, that would be the better place. I think improving the adult center 
is the better way of doing it. It wouldn't interrupt what's going on now. And I see, I think as you see, I've been here for five years. This is an outstanding community. Um, it's a com compassionate community. It's been told as that, I learned recently. So um, just think about maybe some other places other than disrupting this particular area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Uh, I have one additional speaker card at this point, uh, Cynthia Oliva. Good evening. Um, I purchased my home here in San Carlos when I was 22 years old. Done raising my kids, a few of you I know on the board and mayor, we've raised our kids here. I brought my mother into this community because it's a great community, San Carlos. Since my mother's retirement, she has become actively involved with the senior center. I myself attend lunch there every Monday, and I gotta say, this is like the best group of family that I have outside. I'm probably the youngest one that hangs out with these people <laughs> and do things and activities and try to volunteer as much as I can with them. But also, as I get older, I'm looking forward to playing my share of bingo and meeting my friends and people that I've grown with in my community. Um, 1982, that's a young building. That's a baby still. Um, I don't believe in just getting rid of it. I really believe in the remodel. Um, when we see the pictures of the new center that they're showing, I don't see any old people in that picture. I don't see any old people in activities. I don't see people playing bingo. I see a bunch of kids, which I support. Believe me, I've raised my kids. I support all the young activities in our area. But I don't want to see these seniors lose anything. They depend on it. They love it. It's their family. It's their outlet. And so many of them look forward and hang out there when it's hot, when it's cold when they need each other, when somebody's lost their husband or their wife. It's a great, great building, and there's so many memories in it. And I would just like to see the city council and you, Mayor, um, to really look into the remodel instead and keep it. I think so much can be done. It has so much character. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, anybody else want to address the council on this topic? OK. Um, so I, I was I was just trying to establish a little bit of a frame here for for uh, 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 what direction we give staff going forward. So, comments, Matt. Um, there is, as I was listening to you speak earlier, it sounded like it was an option of, you know, go ahead and hire the architect, look at the remodel, and then from there start doing work, as in you know, fixing things that are broken, and at the time you're doing that, you're also moving some walls around. But there is another option that architects are used to, which is fast-tracking um, a project, which means you're doing, you, you begin your design work, and then as you're still working on your design work, you, you actually start construction. Um, and the reason you might want to do something like that is so that something like a mechanical system could get worked on and repaired as long as you know you're not uh, doing something, throwing good money after bad. In other words, re replace a mechanical system and then find out later, oh, w that's where the toilets are going to be, so we're going to have to move it now. But fast tracking doesn't, you know, I mean, they, they, they keep that in mind when they fast track. So if we want to do something a little quicker is all I'm saying. You could do it that way. Yeah. Other comments? I, d I just think, and again, you know, Mr. Grocott indicated good money after bad, and I'm, I'm right there. I, I don't ever want to do that. Having said that, however, looking at what's there, some of the pictures that Ms. Boland showed us, I feel like um, we need to fix those things. And I don't know what it costs to fix those things, but hopefully it's not an un un unwieldy amount of money. Uh, and I think that's the first thing we have to do. Uh, secondly, um, I, would, I would probably go along with the, uh, we, we sent the, or we, uh, I guess, awarded the contract in February and I would probably concur with that for the remodel uh, at this time. Uh, I don't know about the fast track part of it because I'm not an architect, but uh, I, would, I would concur with that. So those are the, my two things. But I really think we need to spend, and I, I know it's, somebody might say, well, you're going to spend, you're going to fix something, you're going to move it, 
and not necessarily a huge amount of movement, but there's got to be some money that's put into that, in my opinion, right now. Hopefully, uh, thousands as opposed to hundreds of thousands to get get the thing up to up to up to speed for the folks that use it. Uh, they deserve that. The whole community deserves it. And, and then proceed again with, as I said, with the uh, with the remodel as opposed to the larger uh, uh, larger picture one. Okay. Thoughts from this side? Um, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> I was looking at sure. him first, but oh, no, um, I thought so. You know, with respect to the public comment tonight, uh, I I sort of put myself on the side of you know the the bigger vision. Um, I think. That and I, I'm a, a user of the Adult Community Center. I've taken ballroom dancing classes there a couple times, uh, and it's it's a great center. But I think, um, you know, going back to our earlier conversation at the very beginning of the night, you know, there's limited public land, and um, increasing quality of life through additional public facilities is, you know, is I see kind of the main mission of the council. And I think that the idea of adding aquatic center is something that comes up all the time. I think it would be a huge benefit uh, to the community. And I think we can do it in such a way that um, we, we don't lose um, you know, community rooms, we don't lose activities, we, we augment and we grow and we build something um, that the whole um, community derives a, a tremendous amount of benefit from it. So uh, I, I think that's, it's a substantial undertaking and we would need, you know, um, a big campaign behind it, but um, it's something that I'd like to be part of. And um, I would, because of that, I mean, I would recommend, you know, going with staff's recommendation of kind of the minimum necessary to keep the facility operational and safe, um, but move forward with uh, looking at the bigger vision. Okay. Ron? Well, I, I too, am a fan of the, of the, uh, the bigger vision, the, the, the community center, but I think my problem here is that we've got, I have three choices. I'm going to improve 150000 and fix a boiler, do nothing, or do a full remodel. And that's why I brought it up earlier. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's another option there that we could have a, a menu of things that we could decide to spend money on. If, if we've got a, what is it, $1.6 million budgeted for this, maybe there are some things in addition to just fixing the boiler that we could do that don't use all that up that keep the adult center, adult community center viable for an indefinite period of time while we work on this. Because this, the, the, a large community center is admittedly, uh, it's a huge project and it's going to take some time. It, it would require acquiring at least one apartment building. Do we own one or we don't own either one of them? So, okay, it requires acquiring two. Apartment buildings. It's a big undertaking. It's a big. It's a big ticket item. Uh, so that I, I would like to have a choice to do some improvements that are more than just fixing the broilers. The boilers. Do you have broilers in there too? Um, anyway, I would. I would like to have that. Uh, I mean, if the choice is between spend 1.6 and spend 150, uh, I'm probably more inclined to do 1.6. But I really like to have another option. Yeah, if it's quick. Yeah, just so the way I see it is that staff is asking for a contingency budget um, to keep it going. Staff can always come back and ask for more money once that's expended. And so, and I would I would expect and anticipate that if we spent the 150 and there were still significant problems that made the facility unsafe or um, you know in need of dire repair, that staff would come back and say, "Hey, I need another 150." So I view it as staff is saying. I need $150,000 right now to make these immediate repairs. And so I'm inclined to say yes, and then with the confidence that there will be additional requests as needed. Um, Jeff, let me ask you a question, and I'm putting you on the spot because I think, uh, as Christine was saying, you probably have the most insight into what was in that conceptual. Please do, yeah. So, um, To me, I was actually taken by uh, Matt's comments and a couple of the speakers' comments about Gee, you know, when you think about it, it kind of really would be a shame to toss that building aside mm -hmm. if there is a way to if there is a way to integrate it into a bigger uh, uh, project. So, do you think that that is that is feasible? It seems to me when I look at the, the the plot of land we're talking about having to 
uh, acquire to be able to do the bigger project, that, that being able to build the project around the, the existing senior center, remodeled, there's probably some way to do that. It, it didn't, doesn't strike me that it's kind of like so integral that it has to get knocked down. Well, yeah, I mean, I would have to agree with you. I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer, but they did build a wall around China, so I'm sure we could find a way to build around <laughs> the existing ACC. And again, you know, the larger concept is just that. It's it's a concept. And, and when it was floated, I think one of the things that maybe didn't come through was the idea there is to create a facility that encompasses several different facilities. So you would, in, in these types of facilities, if you're familiar with, you know, the several, there are several community centers throughout the county that have a community center and they have an adult community center and they're connected together, but they're sort of separate wings and they fulfill, you know, very different functions. But, you know, then there's some cross-pollination that happens too. And I think we've gotten that sense um, from our staff and from the community who use the ACC that they have, you know, that there's an evolving vision at the ACC for the types of services and programmings that would be there uh, in the future. So I think you would design it in such a way. Now, whether or not you could design around the building is going to be a question for uh, an architect and an engineer. And a lot of that's going to have to do with the ability to do underground parking and whether or not you, you're going to be able to underground park the ACC while it's still standing there. Right. I seriously doubt the answer is going to be yes, but again, we're getting beyond my experience. Well, now. but that's helpful because, because personally, my ideal set of directions for staff would be uh, bring us the request to authorize whatever you need to repair immediately. Okay, and then the, the one question I would like answered reasonably quickly is, is there a way, not, not to build a wall around it, because I, I'm, I'm almost vi visualizing something more conceptually like was done with the Hacienda, where, where new structures were added around old structures, but it wasn't, you know, it was sort of to create some kind of uh, uniform vision, or at least uniting vision. Um, and find out whether or not it's possible. Figure out, do, do what's necessary quickly to figure out whether it's possible to do that. Your question, your point about, gee, maybe underground parking blows that idea out of the water. It says, if you want to have a bigger facility, it has to have underground parking, and then you have to take the ACC, the existing ACC down. That's the kind of information I would like to have, because then I could make a more rational decision saying, okay, what are the odds that we're actually going to be able to achieve that bigger vision versus what does it cost versus, versus whatnot. And then I would feel more comfortable coming back saying, okay, either forget that for now, go ahead with the full remodel, or go ahead with the full remodel but start fleshing out this other thing to see, see how we might evolve it over time to be a bigger facility. Do you see what I'm getting at? I do. I do. You're, you're looking. I'm, what I hear you saying is that you would like to pursue the larger concept for the time being insofar as you want to further flush out some alternatives around that. But that would include keeping the existing ACC. Correct. Correct. And that and that it, and to me, the, the near term thing I'm looking for you looking to you for is what are the gotchas in that? Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what's that? Because because then then you know um, if the council decided no, we really want to go with the bigger vision, and it has to involve uh, tearing down the structure or significantly replacing it, then we would be in a position to make a judgment as to whether that's what we wanted to do. R right now, we're not sure. We just sort of because and, and I'm not, that's not a complaint. It's a conceptual thing at this point. So there's no way we could tell. But that's the additional information I'd like to get. Right, and and I think if I can speak just for a minute on the, this $150,000 issue. That number is really not tied to a lot of reality. It's, it's simply staff's best guess for if you weren't going to do the $1.6 million project, what are we likely going to have to spend over the next 24 months to keep the facility operational? And that's where we're saying 150000 It could be more. It could be half a million if, if things break. Uh, to keep the existing facility going. So really the question for the council is, do you want to pursue, do you want to delay the $1.6 million remodel project of the ACC in favor of exploring larger concept, conceptual project of a joint type facility? And if you do, the council asked when we came before you uh, a few weeks ago, then 
how much can we expect to spend on the existing ACC to make sure that it's comfortable and operational moving forward? And, and I'm just going to make one other comment, and then I'll ping the rest of the dais. For me, my answer to that is, yes, I, I am comfortable delaying the full remodel, but only for a little while. It, and, and what I want to know is, is whether or not I can delay it further because we find a way to integrate this stuff together or not. Other thoughts? We each sort of said some different things. I just want to ask the city attorney, can we vote on some of these things tonight? It says, it says a study session, but if the no, no, tonight it's just general direction to okay. staff to bring things back okay. to well, you. I, I disagree with the mayor. I, I agree with Mr. Grocott. I think, you know, I guess I have a, a vested interest because to, to float a bond measure for $20 million, let alone, or to $50 million, I mean, talk about it. It was a rough estimate from 20 to 60. That's rough. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's rough. But... Uh, I think there's other priorities in the in the city, unfortunately, uh, that we have to work on, and it's under the ground, and that's what I think we have to work on first. So that's why I can't okay. I can't look at the bigger picture. I'm looking at let's do the remodel, let's keep that building going, so these folks have a place to go. That's just my 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 push. Well, and I'm, I'm just saying, I, I, no, 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 there's not a, we can't float a million bond issues, and I'm looking to float a bond issue for the underground sometime before I get off here. So. I, I think I think uh, actually that sort of helps encapsulate it. I mean, uh, do maybe the simplest way to do this is to say is there who who wants to give direction to staff to move ahead coming back with the 1.6 million dollar full remodel right now you know we can't vote on it tonight but that's the direction we want to give staff well that's the direction i want to give that's what you want to give yeah. matt i i don't mind giving it a, a a quick look it's going to cost us some money to do that mm -hmm. to see you know can you take this building and incorporate it into this grandiose idea you know, I, I think you can. I, I understand the thing about parking, but I, I just think you can. Okay. So maybe if it could be done quickly without a lot of extra expense, you'd yeah. support doing that. Cameron. Uh, I, as I said before, I'm all for um, 150. Bigger is better with Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't say it that way, but, um, but yeah, the, uh, I'm, I'm a supporter of the vision, and I think we should move in that direction and allocate the minimum necessary. Okay, fair enough. Ron? Yeah, I, I, well, boy, talk about being on the fence. Um, I, off. I, I, I like to know. I, we got 10 more minutes. I, I think I'm, I'm falling toward, <laughs> as much as I really want to see a new adult uh, or a, a new community center, I, I think that probably the wiser thing to do now is go in the direction of the full remodel. Um, we can always study those other things. But in the event that those don't work out, there's community uprising against it or something, we need to have a viable uh, adult community center. So that's the, I would lean, at least in, at, at this point in time, toward giving staff direction to pursue the, the, the full remodel. I am... Uh, 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 as I explained before, interested in getting a little bit of additional information before I fully commit to the full remodel. So I guess I fall someplace between Matt and Cameron. Um, and I think what that means is that there is uh, the, the view of the dais is we would like staff to do a little bit more work to see if it can flesh out um, a way that you could do, you could conceptualize a bigger thing without jeopardizing the remodeling work. But um, but it's it's not a strong consensus, okay? Because it's it's three and two. Yeah, and and I might characterize it as three one and one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's that's, but, that, that's why. No, but I, here's that's what fair. here's based on the conversation that we've had, and it, and it's a good one. I mean, you, I know it says it's dealing with a new issue, and this is a new issue is always a struggle in the beginning to kind of come up with the process mm -hmm. how to move it forward. So how about we say we bring this back in no more than three months with an, with an action, you know, either plan one. I don't want to try to put one plan ahead of the other, but either we have for you the $1.6 million remodel mm -hmm. back on the table and some alternatives about, you know, either this full concept of a joint facility or a way to create a new facility in conjunction with the existing facility, which you would also want to make the decision to move forward with the remodel at that time. 
So uh, you, that works you for kind of have two, you'll have two remodel options and one big option. Got it. Uh, with, with regards to the ACC um, on this issue. People, everybody okay with that? I like that. All right. Yeah. Sooner the better. Make it so. Good. All right. Um, let's see. That brings us to, oh, finally, new business. Um, I'm going to suggest to my colleagues, since as uh, Bob pointed out, we're at T minus 10 minutes before we have to go on extension, um, and I want to give the council an opportunity to perhaps uh, push something off to the to uh, the next meeting or a future meeting. My thought being that the uh, that would be the uh, satisfaction survey. So I'd like actually to return and take up item 9E off the consent agenda. Um, make sure we get that addressed and then deal with the other two items under new business that are short shot clock items. Uh, everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay. And then we'll separately visit the issue whether we want to, how far we want to extend the meeting. So um, 9E, Matt, I believe you had asked to have that pulled off. So, I did, yeah. Um, do we have, oh, we'll give Jeff a chance to, okay. You want me to just ask my con Yes, if you, if you just have a question, that's fine. We don't need a staff well, it's presentation. Not, yeah, so a couple things. Um, I don't know how much the other council members you know, looked at this given it was on the consent calendar, but my concern is uh, particularly, you know, we're, th this request that things be done with staff can handle addendums to this policy. That concerns me because these are public records they're owned by the public and to make amendments to the policies to something that belongs to the public um, and, and allow it to be done at the staff level no disrespect to the staff but I, I just think it should always be something that's even if it's just on the consent calendar it gives the public the opportunity to look at how what's the record keeping we're doing with our documents and then um, so I, I don't like that part of the agenda item and then furthermore, looking at the actual matrix that's given and the uh, items and how long they're to be retained, uh, there were some areas that I was concerned. I don't know if we have the time tonight to dig into those, but um, particularly having to do with council minutes and videos um, and some of the things that the city manager works on, uh, I'm concerned about, and then the last one that I was concerned about is uh, citizen inquiries. It just has it as three years, and I think there needs to be some type of uh, asterisk to that topic because if it's like, for instance, let's take something current, the transit village, and there's a citizen inquiry, that inquiry should stay current and in our records until the transit village, just as an example, is built in the ground and done. Um, and, if, and if it takes more than three years for that to happen and some, some inquiry is thrown out uh, and the developer's done something that, you know, Dimitri was concerned about, but Dimitri's request is thrown away, that's not a good thing. I, I understand. Before we, we have other questions, uh, Mr. Rubens, Greg, would I be correct in assuming that you probably have a role to play in the records retention policy? Yeah, I, um, I worked with staff to review the policy and and these updates that are proposed are... Um, but let me, I'm sorry, I actually had a question. Oh. So, uh, Jeff, I, we need you back, sorry. Um, uh, the question I was going to ask is, um, uh, is it necessary that we deal with the uh, uh, records retention amendment tonight or... Can uh, uh, sounds like there, there may be may even be some opportunity for some more offline discussion uh, to take place. Yeah, I, do, I don't believe there's anything critical about okay. that item for tonight's agenda. Okay, um, we can bring it back. I, 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 what I'd like to do is, if, if it's okay, is we bring it back yeah, and maybe we'll yeah, put it on the. Uh, appreciate that. Um, sure. If you have an opportunity to talk to staff, maybe you can resolve where they can change some things, and if not, we'll we'll put it on the main agenda so that we can discuss it. Um, Okay, so we will table that item. Um, Thank you. And um, let's see, the joint letter from the city and PG&E on line 147. 
we're taking things out of order. We're, we're, yes, that's okay. Oh, I know. The letter was emailed to us. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Jeff Maltby, City Manager. Uh, as promised, uh, we have a joint letter uh, on the council agenda tonight. Uh, this letter would be sent from uh, PG&E and the city to our residents, their customers, uh, sort of outlining, uh, really it's mostly forward focused on how we move forward uh, with line 147. Uh, there's, I think from the city's perspective, a lot of information that's not in that letter. Uh, I think from PG&E's perspective, there's probably a lot of information that's not in that letter. Uh, the letter is, in fact, a compromise. Uh, we've gone back and forth with PG&E. Uh, there's been several iterations of this letter, as you uh, might imagine. And these are the areas that we could agree on to, to put in a letter. And I, I don't want to say that there's a lot of outstanding um, issues uh, that aren't in there. There's two. Uh, one dealing with the city's reimbursement uh, for um, uh, the costs associated with line 147. The other, um, the sort of ongoing dispute that, that we've had over the, uh, the operation, operating pressure of the line, uh, where our expert believes that uh, a lower number uh, is appropriate uh, currently for line 147, uh, PG&E and the CPUC. Uh, and more importantly at this point, the CPUC, who's made the ruling that 330 pounds uh, is safe for the operation of that line. We have, uh, in a sense, appealed that decision, which is a rehearing in front of the CPUC. Uh, there's a lot of uh, due process and, and very specific uh, legal nuance to uh, dealing with utilities and the uh, Public Utilities Commission in California, as we have all learned. Uh, this is our attempt to inform the public on how we're moving forward. How we would do that primarily would be for the next several months, uh, PG&E has agreed to, to step up their monitoring program. We have a PG&E representative here this evening who could uh, explain that uh, in more detail than myself in terms of what their plan is. Uh, the larger uh, solution or step potentially in, in solutions here is the pigging of the line that we've talked about. Uh, in order for PG&E to be able to put their probe through the line, a couple of things have to occur. Uh, first, they have to take out a couple of bends in the pipe that the probe just simply can't navigate, so it will get stuck going through, so it's not a piggable line currently. PG&E's already moved forward with the engineering uh, for that uh, improvement. Uh, they're going to be uh, uh, working with the city and, and uh, other uh, state agencies. There's going to be some uh, state agency permitting required for them to be able to do that work through the Department of Fish and Game. Possibly the Army Corps engineers uh, may have to sign off as well. Uh, we're already working with our elected officials, our, our state and federal elected officials, to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to fast track the permitting so that PG&E can get in there and make those repairs. Uh, when I met with and the mayor met with uh, uh, Chris Johns, the president of uh, PG&E recently, he firmly believed that not only they could uh, design this project, get the permitting for the project, do the work, but also be able to pig the line in 2014, this year. We think that's a good solution for moving forward because it provides what we've been missing all along. It provides the information on what is in the ground. What is line 147? Uh, comprised of in terms of materials, welds, all those kinds of things that the, the probe looks for, what condition is that line in, answers those questions. Certainly we all hope that what the probe will find is that the line's in good shape, but if it doesn't, getting the probe through there is going to uh, hopefully lead to some uh, uh, any necessary repair work that it, that it finds uh, moving forward. The letter's really meant to focus more on this. There will be um, a, a separate community meeting that's planned by PG&E that the city will participate in. I believe we've got a date, uh, April, you know, 16th. April 16th. Uh, venue? Trinity, I think. Yeah. Trinity. Trinity Presbyterian uh, in the community that will be participating. I'm sure we'll have lots of dialogue. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from uh, the public. 
about the operating pressure and, uh, as well as others. So this letter is our best joint attempt to move forward the city and pg e in terms of uh, a path uh, uh, communicating with the public of how we plan to resolve this issue uh, moving forward. Mr. Mayor, yes. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, extend the meeting for 10 minutes. Just in time. Seconds? Is there a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Or abstaining? I'm not voting on anything, no. Okay, there he goes. <laughs> I'll leave it up to Crystal to figure out how to record that. I'll be that. with you the next time. Um, uh, uh, I have one question for Mr. Maltby. Other questions that people may have? Matt. Just a comment. When I read the letter, there's two things that are missing, and but they were in Mr. Maltby's presentation, and that is that the monitoring is at a higher grade level, more frequent, and I think the letter should tell the public that. Um, and then I think the next steps, it should say that this is being done uh, at, at a quicker level, quicker pace than PG&E first planned, because otherwise it looks like, you know, we cried wolf, but nothing happened. And indeed, we cried wolf, but something did happen. Mm -hmm. There was a result of our saying to PG&E, we see an issue here, we're concerned, we're calling an emergency, and so forth. And so I think those two items need to be in the letter. Okay, so that would be the fact that the, the project was moved up from 2016 to 2014 correct and and the other one is that the monitoring when it mentions monitoring more, the, more detail about the monitoring well just that it says uh the line of 140 147 by increased monitoring of the pipeline more detail yes as yeah. requested by St. Carlos. yeah something that gives so us a little copy what do you think um, you're signing this too um yeah. excuse me i mean I, I we're asking questions of staff Sorry, to pop you. Well, I, okay. I, it, this letter is signed by both people. I understand that. So but we're we still, can say anything we want, but if she doesn't agree to it, we're Bob, just wasting time. I, I understand that, but we're still in the process of asking questions of staff. Okay, I'd like to do that first. Um, other questions? I, I had sort of one comment, which is that I, I, I appreciate that these letters are very difficult to write, uh, and I know it's probably gone back and forth. I do think it's a bit confusing. I think that, and the lead is kind of buried, um, and I, and I, I. I'm not sure. It, it provides a lot of information. I think the goal is to potentially to reassure the public and to communicate next steps. I don't know how effectively it does that. So it's so it's a. I understand that these things are difficult, but I guess I would have liked to see something that was a little bit more clear and where there was a little more clear message for for residents. So. Okay. Ron, no, my know? only comment is that you know this is going to our customers. So it, it's really got to say, it, it has to send the message to our customers that, we, uh, that we've been paying attention and that we've gotten results. Basically supporting what Matt was saying. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Those are good suggestions. The, yeah, I, I like Matt's suggestions too, although I, and I want to come back to Bob's point about this is a joint letter. Um, my only comment uh, is one I've shared with Mr. Maltby, uh, pardon me, Jeff, already in private when we were going over this. Um, I, I have no objection to uh, the reference in here to the CPUC making the, you know, their decision. Uh, however, we don't agree with that. I mean, we wouldn't be involved in our appeal if we agreed with that. And we believe it's not just because we made that up out of whole cloth. We actually believe there's some science and engineering behind that. So. If we're going to say, if we're going to cite the PUC reference, I want to see us cite the fact that, um, however we phrase it, that uh, we have a different opinion. Okay, and frankly, I don't see how it, why it couldn't be drafted to simply lay out both statements in there and say, you know, one of the things that's happened as a result of the two sides trying to find a way to work forward together is the increased monitoring and and the increased safety inspections and the acceleration of the pinging. So. Um, that's kind of the feedback, I guess, um, Papia, if uh, I know you had wanted to address the council, so please feel free. Thank you, Mayor Albert and council. Um, I appreciate Mr. Gokot's comments, and one of the things that we really wanted to ensure was conveyed in the letter is our deference to the city's concerns and the leadership and the commitment that the, the council has 
and that we are listening and we are committing to increasing the monitoring of line 147, not just until we pig, but until we get the results for the pigging. So I think that's one commitment that we are, we are providing the city. And then the other one, of course, is ensuring that pigging happens this year. But the last one would be the, the, the commitment that we are showing the deference that we, we really truly hear your concerns and, and want to work with you. And, and there is language in there that demonstrates that the city showed leadership and commitment and that we are, we are responding to that. So I'm happy to take a look at that and see if we can make that stronger to demonstrate that. With regards to the monitoring, it, it does talk about the request and that we're, we are adhering to that request um, and that we're doing that throughout the process, um, not just until we actually pig the line, but um, something that the city manager uh, made very clear is that you, you know you want the results, you also want the opportunity to assess those results, um, and we respect that. So that sentiment is also reflected in the letter, and and that was the intent. Um, I, what about the uh, observation I had made that I'd like some reference made to the fact that that we the two of us have a difference of opinion on the uh, on the safe operating pressure. I respect that we have a difference of opinion, but I think from a going forward standpoint, I know PG&E, we're much more comfortable in, in highlighting where we are moving forward. Um, it's been played out that we've had this difference and, and the delta in the pressure. Uh, my preference would be that we communicate that at the open house or we can talk about it more in those settings, but in order to move this forward, uh, we really want to focus on the pigging that those activities and then working with the city on the assessment. If, if we're going to focus on moving forward, uh, what do you think about simply eliminating that paragraph citing what the California PUC did and not referencing that we have a difference of opinion? I'm fine with that. We can look at that, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, that would be fine with me because then we're not, neither of us is taking a position on it. We can talk about it there. I um, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, one additional question. Yes, go, Cameron. A real quick question. So the letterhead says PG&E and uh, City of San Carlos. Are, are we going to create custom envelopes that say both things, or is it going to come in a PG&E envelope or a City of San Carlos envelope? So PG&E has the intent to mail the the letter, so it's a PG&E envelope that's sending both letterheads. So we've done that in other communities in the okay. past, and we use our infrastructure and our cost to do it. Great. Thanks. Okay. Matt, did you have? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lost by the retort because I don't know. Is it going to say that uh, we're doing? Because we're you always do monitoring. So my point is, I thought you agreed to do additional monitoring or monitoring to a, you know, a tighter schedule or something. Correct. So we so do leak the surveying say that. annually, and we're in the letter just simply says increased monitoring. It does work. Um, I apologize, I don't have the letter right yeah. in front of me. Okay. It's I under do. the next steps towards the end. But the next steps, the, okay, let me look. The goal is to essentially leak survey monthly until we have the results. Now it would be aerial leak surveying and also aerial patrol. So the pipe will have eyes on it nearly three of the four weeks of each month. It's the last sentence of the next steps paragraph. Through the chair, I hate to be Mr. Practical, but Mr. Malpe, I hate to be Mr. Practical, but wasn't this, le when are we, since there's a lot of folks that want to change the letter, I don't happen to be one, but there's other folks that do, and she has to go back and probably check with somebody else. Other folks at and we're not going to have a, and we're not going to have a council meeting until April 14th, and the meeting's supposed to be on April 16th. Uh, how does this all work? Just explain it to me. Well, either we bring the letter back to you for a second look, I um, in which case we're either going to delay mm -hmm. the meeting or okay. or the the letter and the meeting aren't designed. Okay. They're actually designed to work independently. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I actually have a, a solution to that, which we've used in the past, uh, which, which is the, the mayor. Pardon me? Authorize the mayor. Correct. Bingo. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I have heard. No problem with that. I authorize the mayor right now, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, fine. I will entertain a motion. I move we authorize the mayor to uh, redo the letter or send the letter uh, with negotiate a, with PG and E. Negotiate with PG and E and and make the uh, appropriate changes to the letter. Is that fair enough? Is there a second? There is a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, any further discussion? Yeah, uh, just a point of fact, I, th I, th I see what's being said about the last sentence. And I think actually, Mr. Mayor, if, if you did remove the second paragraph, it actually adds emphasis to, because the inspection thing is mentioned twice. One time it's mentioned, there's nothing about increased monitoring or anything. And then when it's mentioned the last time, and I see what you're saying about it refers to our leadership and so forth, then it's clear. To me, it's clear. So I think your solution possibly of just taking out that one. May have accidentally solved two problems. You may have solved it. So. Even better. Um, so if we could call the roll, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grosselli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Mayor Obert? Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate You're it. You're quite welcome. Look forward to working with you on this. Um, the uh, last item, I think, uh, Jeff, we're, we're going we're gonna to postpone doing the, the customer satisfaction survey. Um, uh, we do have a consultant up here from Southern California to present the results. Now, we can give you, I mean, you can accept the results. We can just do a presentation in the future uh, at a later date, maybe as part of the budget. This isn't, you know, you're, you're in action tonight on that item doesn't really do anything. It's a presentation to the council. I understand. Uh, but we will have to pay to bring our consultant back. Um, and uh, how much roughly would you estimate that to be? Uh, so little that I think you should adjourn the meeting uh, early Fine. tonight. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get at. All right, so uh, w with all due respect to the consultant, we do appreciate you being here. Just this, the other parts of the meeting ran longer than we thought. Uh, there is one last item that I do want to uh, bring up to the council's consideration because it is on a short shot clock. This is the uh, 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 mayor's water conservation challenge. This is something that was brought to my attention by uh, um, Kathleen Gallagher and the folks over at San Carlos Green and uh, Cameron, uh, who, had been, uh, as you know, is our liaison to them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's basically... I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mayor. Yes, yeah, I was just going to say we're, we're at the time limit that you've authorized before. So All right. We so, probably need uh, to get a little bit more time to, to do this last I time. will, if anybody cares to, I will entertain a motion for five more minutes. I'd like to move that we extend the meeting by five minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. No. All right. Three to falling two. Crystal, I'm sorry. Put me down for no on the one before, too. Um, <laughs> you can't change your vote after the fact. I can. Just like the state, I can change the button. All right. So um, this is a, uh, uh, I thought this was uh, uh, a timely thing to do. Uh, in many cases, these are items, uh, as you all know, who have served as mayor, these are things that uh, uh, organizations in the city actually do all the work on themselves, and we just issue a proclamation. Um, those types of things are typically left up to the mayor's discretion. The reason this one's in, in front of you is because there is a little bit of a resource footprint on staff resources. It's probably in the neighborhood of about um, a grand, I think, plus or minus, uh, in terms of sending out a few press releases and drafting some things. So it's mostly staff time uh, that we're talking about, and not a lot of it, but it is there. And so, uh, since, uh, uh, so that's why I brought it back to the dais. Um, any questions? Do, you need a, do we need a motion? Uh, if we're going to do it, yes, I believe. Actually, we don't have it set up as a, as a motion. It's 11C. It says I move to approve. Well, there's, there's no resolution. There's no resolution. Attached, but, yeah, motion. Motion. Would okay, be fine. Right. So, uh, I'm ready. Go for it. I move to approve the city's participation in the mayor's water conservation challenge. I second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? The only thing I can say is I have no idea what this is about. So I can't vote for it because I don't know what it's about. What is the challenge about? I have no idea. And I don't, want to I don't necessarily want to hear it, so I'm going to vote no. <laughs> I mean, this is really poor. We didn't even get a report on this. Seriously. Well, this what, we should have gotten something. What does the challenge mean? The, I can't the, vote on something I don't know the, what it means. There was, did that material did the not? challenge drop it by 20%, drop it by 100%? I don't understand it. Did the material, I did the material not get provided? The That's Coma the, letter, I don't believe, was was provided to okay. the council. So I'm sorry. Yeah, but that wasn't know. my understanding of our I, Not against water challenges, but I don't know any guy what it's about. Yeah. So that's, that's fair enough? Well, no. Is that's fair enough. Is there a time limit on it? Uh, it's, I believe, it, as I recall, it's like a month. 
or, or two months, something like that. It's a fairly short thing. It's basically, uh, the way it works is people enroll in it and make pledges to reduce water consumption by certain amounts and over a certain period of time. And, and uh, one competes for prizes based on how many people in your community sign up and how much water reduction they commit to. And as I recall, and Cameron, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the, it, it's pretty much on an honor system. I mean, it's not like there's an audit process that goes out there. Yeah, it's, it's basically a way to raise awareness about right. um, water reduction strategies and to give, uh, you know, in this case, San Carlos Green a vehicle to try and create some friendly competition among cities to get people motivated to think about water conservation. Correct. So uh, I don't expect that to sway your vote, but that's, there you go. All right. So, um, just one last question. Is there a cost to it? Yes, as I explained, it's about $1,000 in staff time. That's why it's here. Otherwise, I would have yeah. just done it. Right, right. So, um, Crystal, the roll, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? No. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Mayor Obert? Yes. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting.